We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ne aşağı, ne yukarı. Ne fazla, ne az. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. You get a lot of killers. Why well, do you think our country is so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. All right, welcome to Varn Blog, and today we're talking about Forex, which is an embellishment of some of the history and theories of MMT, uh, modern monetary theory taken in a new direction to try to explain the inconsistencies with other monetary theories of the past. And we are also going to be talking about Christine Dazine, the uh, the recent scholarship of Colin Drum. Um, we might briefly dip into the history of chartalism, but actually that's probably going to be a whole nother episode in the future. Um, and definitely it's another series of articles over there at strange matters, which you guys just got funded. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So, and, and, and thanks to everybody who, um, you know, maybe in your audience who, who ticked on over to ours and, and, uh, and, and funded us. I mean, that's, it's, it's really incredible. We were, we were, ver we were very, very, very grateful for that. Yeah, there's not many left magazines that I endorse these days um, uh, for a variety of reasons. You guys are one of them, and there are other people I don't hate, and that's about the best we're going to get. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have a honoring attitude and reputation to keep up, um, but let's talk about the long history of money. Now, we, we in our last conversation and episode, which let's... Uh, Let's do this A team style. In our last episode, our uh, our trepidatious heroes went through the medieval and early. Well, actually, the medieval, the pre medieval, and most of human history involving electrum, um, ending up in a murky amass in the beginning of the early modern period, where suddenly the return of MMT like relations emerged. Our heroes now must explain how we got to the current and why everything is so weird. And we will now turn it over to our intrepid heroes to figure out what the hell is going on with money. Um, JMT <laughs> and Steve, you may begin. Should we rock, paper, scissors to oh, see? Oh, well. <laughs> uh, as I recall, in part one, you know, so we start our history where David Graeber did in his book, Debt the First 5,000 Years, uh, more or less, in ancient Mesopotamia, where you observe some centrally centrally issued credit monies taking hold um, amid, by centrally issued by temples, and people start having these interesting credit relations with one another, but also they have other types of monetary relations um between between temples outside of the domestic sphere of these temples such that there was one and so you kind of have these two competing observed monetary relations that are going on at the same time you have this credit one and then the the money one the the outside money which we'll we'll get into more today so yeah, so to to recap, uh, forex as we discussed last time, and yeah, and if you guys want to check this out, um, I will uh, edit the show notes to add back in the article, uh, where you got wait, it's not released yet, is it? 
No, we are. It is probably going to be released in the next uh, week or two because okay. we're finishing up the the history ones right. first. So, well, then I won't do that. Um, so when it comes out, you can check my Twitter um, for this article so you can follow along on your own. What what I remember us getting through is the development of Electrum and its ties to temples, then getting into the medieval period where we couldn't really figure out why, um, you know, credit money was not the predominant form of money. And then we recounted MMT's, you know, re recounting, starting with Graeber and then up through the work of Michael Hudson. And then mysteriously skipping a thousand to two thousand years right um into into you know the uh colonial colonial period and we we did cover the beginnings of state coinage in uh in the ancient near east um again kind of seeming developing out of this electrum thing that had happened amongst the temple trading and oh. I have to say the Electrum coins didn't happen until well after the temple trading part, but we did cover them. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Electrum, Very well were, after. Uh, like that's, that's like, almost um, like a couple thousand years, right? Six. Let's see. Electrum was what the first minted coins were made of. And it was about 600, somewhere between 600 to 625 BCE. Right. And that came onto the scene. And then the, um, the temple credit systems, which we started out with, were in ancient Mesopotamia well before that. Yeah. And then, so like we have, um, at the same time as the temples um, were issuing credit um, within their own respective domains, we also have like uh, shipments of precious metals were being used by traders between the temples. And those are happening kind of like concurrently. And then much, much, much later, do we see the first coins, which are like, seem to be this like confusing and mysterious, like combination of those two dynamics at work. Yeah. So to, to, to reiterate what Steve was saying, because it's really, really important. Like, you know, the, a lot of what's at stake here is, you know, why are we talking about all this stuff that happened thousands and thousands of years ago? It's because this is the way, the rigorous way where like not just by kind of assuming certain things about human nature as axioms and then deducing from them but actually like looking at history we can figure out the nature of what money actually is and how it evolved in different times and places through history um and it turn and and it has a lot of consequences for us because depending on what money is fundamentally if you want to call it that like there's very different limitations on, for example, the fiscal policies of governments today, uh, depending on which theory of money is true or more true or, you know, what limitations follow from money being this way rather than that way. So this is why we're talking about all this ancient stuff. And what Steve said just now is like super, super important because if you look at like the oldest money that we have, it wasn't even this stuff that's like in our pockets that we're using to buy stuff. It's stuff that it wasn't stuff at all. It was a, it was a cuneiform tablet that tabulated like, you know, how much things were worth in a single accounting system where everything was worth a certain number of shekels. The shekels weren't, wasn't something in your pocket for the most part, unless you were very, very rich, in which case it was a lump of silver. Um, most people, for most people, like they had to pay however many shekels worth of grain to the temple as like an annual obligation to keep the temple going, which was important for religious reasons and all this other stuff. But, for, there was this second system, which is how the temples talked to each other so that you could like, you know, because this temple, let's say, had like tin and copper, but this other temple over here needs tin and copper and doesn't have it. So how do they get it? Well, they have to have some kind of like trade relation. And it turns out that what they would do is that they had this like whole like, I mean, it was integrated into the accounting system, but people would carry a lump of silver, which had a price in both money systems which were just on the books and therefore if you have a lump of silver it's worth a certain amount of purchasing power in one city and a certain amount of purchasing power in the other city so there was a system in other words by which people did stuff on the local level but there was a second system by which they did stuff 
internationally, you might call it, or between political systems. And this is a pattern that was not just in Bronze Age Mesopotamia. In fact, Bronze Age Mesopotamia, it's a little messy um, because like, there are certain things that haven't even developed about money um, yet, like circulating coinage for the most part. Like, so, so you don't even see it as clearly there as you do in other systems. Like in the contemporary system, that's basically how it is. Countries have their domestic currencies, right? But then if you need to make an international transaction, if you need to import something that you don't make yourself, you need to use the right kind of currency, which is not the one that you as, say, Mexico issue, but is the one – is actually the five that are used for international payments, the five so-called reserve currencies of which the most important um, is the dollar uh, due to the rise of um, U.S. imperial power after World War II. Um, so this this kind of like general framework turns out to be a really good way of connecting both very, very old stuff like the Bronze Age all the way up to the present, like, you know, uh, like the current international dollar system. Because this general framework where you have a domestic currency – you know, that, that for the state that issues it is basically infinite, but you also have whatever you use to make international payments, which is scarce to everybody. Well, actually, I should say historically was scarce to everybody. In the dollar system, the U.S. can issue as many dollars as it wants, so it doesn't even need to worry about, like, you know, imports for the most part, which is part of what happens when you're in charge of the system. Um, but that's a very historically unusual situation. For most people, that outside money is scarce. Whereas the inside money, if you're the state that issues it, it's basically infinite to you. So what we have here, though, in the Lydian question, and I'm going to call it the Lydian question for a minute, even though we discussed this last time, I want to go into a little bit more detail, is the coining of Electrum. Now, Electrum have generally been used across the region of the ancient Near East pretty well into Europe as the standard and for those of you who don't know electrum is a as an alloy of silver and gold um what's interesting about the lydian you know coining of electrum is they can get more precise in the ratios of the metal in the coin um why that's important we don't really entirely understand but what we do know is that these coins which they're mentioned in ancient greece but they're found uh, all the way up into the Black Sea region and all the way down into Mesopotamia and all throughout Greece. And then after the Hellenistic period during Alexander Macedonia's conquest, um, Macedonia, for those of you who pronounce it wrong, you dirty plebeians. Um, uh, just kidding. Um, kind of. Uh, you see a transition which is historically uh, credited to this crocus Crocius, I can't say Greek. Uh, Crocius, yeah, that guy. C R O E S U S. For those who want to look it up, um, for pure gold, sh shifting the assumed money, the monetary system from this electrum, which had been used for like, I guess, a couple thousand years at this point, or at least like fifteen hundred or so, into gold, just straight up gold. Um, and then, and we don't really entirely understand why that shift happens from Electrum into gold. Um, uh, uh, crikey. All right. Um, and um, then that becomes the standard money for a long time. Now, what's interesting about this is particularly after the fall of the Roman Empire, and I guess in some ways this makes sense in your Forex theory, but doesn't tend to make sense in the theories of uh, um, of MMTers, is you have gold money being used in the in the what we might call the late antique or the medieval, are the pre-early modern, whatever the hell you want to call it. I don't care what historic, historiographic names you use for this right now. Um, what you see is a, a shifting where there's an internal credit money and an external like gold money to kind of everything either being paid in kind or paid in kind uh, with gold as the standard transaction material. Now, what is interesting about this is you know, we covered this in the last show. You have this early history of internal credit money covered by people like David Graeber, Michael Hudson, 
but then they do not talk about the end, the late antique period where this gold money becomes dominant and stays dominant as the form of money um, throughout the next thousand years. And in fact, most people think manorialism, what we, you know, what Marxists call feudalism and some other, or, you know, but the various forms of manorialism wouldn't have even have happened um, without this shift to gold because what the Roman Empire tries to do as they start running out of gold reserves is weaken their currency. And as they weaken their currency, it seemingly their trading power starts to fall apart. But that doesn't make sense if if all they're relying on is their internal credit and debt system because they can run that infinitely. And they're a big state, you know, for ancient standards. So we have to then explain why this mattered. And I've always felt like this is where like the Austrians and the classical money story people go up to the MMTers and go, step, 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 step. Um, you can't explain this. Um, and <laughs> you guys have picked up on the theories of uh, of Colin Drum, who's who's in the, I mean, theories, actually history of, by Colin Drum, who's in the chat right now, for those of you who want to ask him, um, who starts picking up on the on this time period in particular and why it may have been necessary to continue relying on coins as opposed to other forms of money. Uh, Colin also re reminds me that they ran out of silver first, which I knew, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a pain in the ass to get the um, the, the, the periodization straight. Um, even after doing it, I have to kind of like remember the exact sequence because it can it can be uh, confusing, especially when you have like multiple metals kind of like circulating at the same time like bimetallism where there's coins that are made of one thing and coins that are made of the other thing and then there's exchange rates into not only different currencies but also like you know from one metal to the other and it's like it's a mess i think that the key thing to get us started on the bicycle is all this stuff about king croesus's coins where he's shifting from an electrum system to a silver system, right? Like in terms of like what the coins are made of and they're able to measure with precision or increasing precision as he is, you know, he's the first king who issues any coin that's made of metal um, or any coin at all, in fact, any circulating currency, but it happens to be a coin made of metal. Um, they are very increasingly attentive over time to how much precisely of silver versus gold content is in the coins, right? Like, that shows that that's important. So that's immediately a kind of like weird, crazy thing from the MMT point of view. But the MMT point of view, to me, when I've read those histories, and, and you guys are now focusing on theory to kind of correct this, mm -hmm. always focuses on nation states, polities, kingdoms, and tribes and enclosed systems as if trade is only ever within those enclosed systems. And so one insight that I think Colin Drum has, and I had been really racking my head around for years looking at this MMT history and then looking at the history of metal coinage was, well, <clears throat> why was it such a problem for the Roman Empire? And why did it really become important during the medieval time period? Now, there are certain MMTers now who will say that the focus on sovereignty and, and strong coinage is a late medieval thing because of writings that they take from uh, Aquinas and other people. Um, but the material evidence seems to be that kings had an incentive even though they were in charge of the purity of the coins to keep the coins as close to the meta ratios and as pure as those meta ratios could get in general. Um, and attempts to debase that coinage tended to have consequences as far back as the Roman Empire. And I never could understand this from the MMT story. Like, I was just like, well, how do you explain that? I never see you try to explain that. And um, to give Colin Drum credit, I mean, he looks at the the ways baronies work, right? And he actually comes out with a reason that kind of explains it. So would you like to go into this? 
Yeah, the the key thing is that the that Bronze Age system where weights of silver were used as like you know a way of translating between the local currencies that never really went away. When coins developed, they were made of metal because people were already accepting certain weights of metal um, as a means of payment between communities. What the coins did, though, is that they created this like this dual system because when a king issues a coin and it conquers your territory – in fact, he usually issued the coin so that the army would be carrying it around so that they could pay for stuff on the other side, um, which was slightly less coercive than um, – than uh than than just like pillaging but the thing is that you have to use the king's coin to pay taxes to the king who conquered you and rules you now right but that's not the only reason so in in the mmt world that's the only reason why you use the coin in the in it's absurd to me though because people don't just trade within a state well i mean it can often be enough to drive the receivability if the relative bargaining power of the central authority to like whoever they're imposing the obligation on is really, really like big, you know? Or if they otherwise are just very trustful right. of, of yeah, the issuing authority. That's absolutely so either, right. either there's like, if there's a very large power imbalance or if they're just unusually trustful of the central authority, then yeah, you can get away with um, just the receivability element within the, the king or the baron's domain. But the trouble is that under most situations where you've just recently conquered somebody, right, like, they don't trust you. And also, like, especially if you're dealing with, like, you know, relations between elites, right, like, the local elites who just got conquered and have their own wealth and ability to raise armies and so on, and, like, you know, the, and the king that just conquered them, like, you know, the negotiating power is not so strong. I mean, like, this is not, like... The, the in the in the ancient world state capacity was not such that you could just like and, and frankly in a lot of places today it's not such that you can just like you know um yeah it's one thing to conquer a country it's another thing to actually like integrate them into your system so, so for example in cancun you go and people are asking for payment in dollars because they're also going to be trading for things in dollars even though they're not going to pay those dollars to the mexican state they're going to pay pesos Right. But those dollars help get them stuff from abroad. And the situation in Mexico is such that that's actually more right. reliable. That's actually a dynamic that we'll get into with the with the with the theory of the barons, which is kind of drums innovation and talking about England, which uh, it, where where which money you use is kind of like or which aspect of money you emphasize the inside of the outside aspect is kind of like a judgment call on how much you trust the state. But before we get there, I just wanted to finish the point about like, OK, so like. It, to sweeten the deal, it's made of silver. The fact that it's made of silver means that, yeah, okay, you have to pay your taxes to this asshole now, and it has to be in his coin. Like, you can't just pay it in a lump sum of silver. It has to be in his, which makes you use it rather than just, like, a lump of silver. But it's made of silver, which means that you can melt it down and use it to buy imports, maybe even imports that you might use against the king. But you're less liable to do so if he's given you at least a little silver in his coins because, well, that's um, that's now like foreign purchasing power. It's not just a purely trust-based system. If it were made of paper or copper, you're entirely at the mercy of the king who has all the silver and therefore all the ability to buy mercenaries and luxury goods and you know all these other food and all these other different things that you might that you might potentially need. Not to mention like you know pay off you know, uh, other people, um, for any number of purposes. But now that you have a little bit of that foreign rather than just domestic purchasing power, and it's lumped in with your domestic purchasing power, it sweetens the deal. And that is kind of what allows these axial age empires to grow. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the main things that allows these like axial age empires to grow much larger than any of the bronze age empires would have dreamed of. Um, yeah. because, and, because it's a way of integrating people. Not only through there. So there, there was the military coinage industrial complex that we talked a little bit about in part one. And then we're also discussing a little now and then, but there was also like the actual age empires. And then later, um, England itself occupying, um, important, important trade nexuses, which it insisted it, it was went to great lengths to impose itself as like a choke point on international trade. 
like so that it could um, acquire quite a lot of the metal content, which could could be used to make coins, but it could be used to do a lot of other things as well. So I need like um, you see so, these like you see these minting systems develop eventually. Like I'm getting ahead of ourselves, I'm getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but um, that uh, the logic that drives them seems to be to the issuer of the 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 person who controls the mint wants to keep the metal not coins but the metal right as like sort of a uh, an unexercised option almost so let's talk about this uh, oh james c did you no, actually, let's let's. Uh, Varm's gonna say something. So let's. There's a, there's a lot I want to unpack here because I want to get off of the of abstract um, yeah. hypotheticals. Um, so, I have been thinking for a long time um, about the crisis of the third century, and I'm not gonna pin you down on that right now. But the one thing that we can see is in these axial age empires, you start seeing coinage being used in most of the major empires that I know of. Um, you see them in Bactria. You see them in uh, most of the Hellenistic kingdoms. We know that Greece had a fairly advanced coin system before, you know, the beginning of the Roman Empire um, with, with all kinds of uh, set exchanges and pretty good tests of metal a metal quality. Um, we also know in the third century, metal, you know, the metal reserves start to run out, um, be uh, beginning with silver, going in through gold, um, and the coinage becomes debased, and that starts uh, manorial holding systems, and and people trying to avoid taxes and coinage uh, by you know running onto manors, particularly as um slavery is less common um now what i find interesting is while this theory makes sense of these large kingdom i mean not kingdoms these large empires um because they're also trading with each other during the axial age and they don't have a lot of trust right and this is talked about a lot in in uh, david graber's book uh Currency emerges between groups that don't trust each other, hence the exchange rates and the temple exchanges and development of states using external currency and internal accounting um, and credit being used within the system. But what we see at the end of, of this time period that we're talking about, which is really kind of the kind of the, the beginning of recorded history and like the high classical period to the end of the high classical period. Right. So for those of you who don't know your periodizations, that's like say the the seventh and sixth century um, BCE up to about the third, fourth century uh, CE uh, AD for those of you who haven't moved over to the new naming convention. So um, what, what I find interesting is like by the ninth century, we're still relying on coins, right? But you have, you occasionally have, particularly in places like England during the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy period and stuff, you have competing powers trying to get the power to control the mint. Uh, so for example, there's this big scandal, like the ninth century where like this Bishop is kind of undercutting an Anglo-Saxon King by minting his own coinage with his own stamp, which would imply also his ability to collect taxes and this, that, and the other. But you also see that these coins are being produced to trade. And we know that because occasionally they have stuff like Arabic on them in, in Mercia in the same time period. So you have these competing attempts to officiate coinage. So there, there's both a sense in which the metal is important for external trade, but there, since there's not a clear state, there's a lot of competing power for who has the legitimacy to print coins for internal things like tax collection, elite trading, etc. Right? So does this get us about to we need to to talk about the barony and get us out of this election period? Or do you think there's still more we need to cover here? Yeah. So I elect them to go. Excuse me. I think that gets us most of the way to where we need to go. Um, and the 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 thing that to understand is that 
like the so I'll, I'll just preface this by saying I actually don't know anything about the crisis of the third century in in monetary terms because I haven't yet been able to research it. Okay. What, where I, so I don't know. But, all right, we 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 have to we have to kind of dig into that. We haven't really touched Rome um, for the most part. What we have done a good amount of though is. Um, looking into and and especially with like the help of um of of drums research and then also kind of like a more kind of like critical reading of Dasan, who nevertheless is like you know good on some of the facts anyway um like wh what we do know is this kind of like transition from antiquity into like the medieval period and then from like the medieval period to what we would call the early modern period like this is this picture is a lot more clear to us so i think that the the place to start is actually the fall of rome for me um, that gets us kind of into Dasan. And remember, the goal of this is that Dasan has her theory, right? Which is like, you know, all money can be made of basically anything. It's issued by – it's uh, all money is fiat money, basically. Uh, you, you can issue it uh, as, the, as the issuer. It circulates. You receive it back. People want to use it because they – can use it to make an obligatory payment to you that you've imposed upon them. Call it a tax, call it an obligation, doesn't really matter. Um, a debt, right? Um, and um, and that's kind of like the thing that keeps, that, that allows whoever issues the currency to mobilize resources. Our theory is that that's basically the story on the domestic level, but there's also this other thing called the international means of payment, which can be many things. Um, like in our age, it's the five reserve currencies. But for most of this thousand year period that we're talking about, it's particular weights of gold or silver. Um, and these, whatever you use as the international means of payment is what you get for, is, is what you need in order to get imports, which means that even currency issuers, uh, for even for currency issuers, the international means of payment is scarce. And this international means of payment, or Forex for short, is something that elites fight over. And indeed, it's fighting over Forex that allows you to, um, to have more security and power in the issuance of your own currency because, like, it – basically means that you're able to control more territory. It also means that people are more willing to use your currency, especially if you peg it somehow to, to a certain amount of Forex. And even if you don't, it, you need a lot of Forex in order to be able to get the imports to make you strong enough that people will take your currency for other reasons. So that's basically the two competing theories, right? Like kind of classical neochartalism versus our theory of Forex, which is kind of chartalist-ish on the domestic level, but has these kind of other add-ons. So the key so the thing reason why this is important though is it reconciles the traditional history of coinage and money with the neochartalist history of core of coinage and money, but in ways that will make neither side particularly happy. Um, I mean, I think I think this is interesting to talk about that when we talk about metal, because one thing I've always noticed is, OK, you have these elaborate trade routes that are very indirect with parties who never interact with each other. Right. Um, directly. Uh, so from North Africa all the way to China during this time period and all the way into like basically the 19th century, um, you have various levels of metal coinage. And yes, other things are sometimes used, um, particularly internally. Uh, but metal coinage trade and metal and metal weight trade seems to be fairly consistent. What is interesting and ties it into this exchange theory here, all right, is that you don't see that as much in the two American continents um, for probably a variety of reasons, one of which is they're not connected up into the system. There's no indirect trade either. So they would not need uh this this kind of system for international exchange i don't know what it was i need to study uh trade in americas but i do know that we don't have a lot of evidence of like pre uh pre-settler uh metal coinage in the americas that i know about um there's a lot of post-settler metal coinage and there's a lot of metal but still um well what i would say is um and I'm, I've only read a couple of books about I, I, the, the Americas are on my list, but I have read some books about the Inca economy, and it does seem like there was actually pretty extensive trade routes that connected like the Aztecs 
all the way oh, down yeah. to the Incas, but they but they had different I would I my theory is, and I have to do more research to figure out what it is, they certainly did not use metal, but they seem to have had some other kind of international means of payment. And we know that in Eurasia, like salt and particular weights of silk and spices would sometimes um be international means of payment. So would tea bricks in the trade between China and Mongolia. Mm -hmm. So there was like, you know, there there, there are other possible commodities and also other possible like issuances that can be an international means of payment it's just that in eurasia it happens for a very long time to have been either gold or silver or both depending on the period right is eurasia into north africa and if people just think about that on the map for those americans who don't know geography just think of, you know, go look at a map right now all this is connected and and the silk road would have connected you from morocco you know up up into europe down into northern india and all the way into china um and so that's something to consider when you think about this foreign exchange being consistent there. Uh, uh, Colin mentions, and I've heard of this, that there's some speculation that things like obsidian uh, and certain grains were used in the We have evidence of massive trade between like different indigenous empires, but we don't know what, you know, what I don't think we, we know how their international exchange really worked. We do know it happened. I mean, otherwise, like the Mayans and the Aztecs wouldn't have had elaborate road and, and canal systems. There would have been no reason for that. Um, I think this is important. I, I don't mean to like bring you in these topics that you don't know, but I think this is stuff to that you do have to look at because it's consistent with what you're finding. And I've never been able to reconcile it with the chartalist story. Because the charterless story to me makes perfect sense within a society that shares language, shares the values, and high social trust. Or that social trust can be imposed by a state, a.k.a. big men with pointy things make you do stuff. Those are the times where this credit and debt system seems to be effective. But that doesn't work between states or in international trade. And I don't want to jump ahead, but this... This actually radically matters for contemporary ideas about things like what causes international inflation, um, et cetera, and so forth. Um, be, because if you view economies as a closed system um, that's internally coherent, then outside demands shouldn't really make a difference. And yet they seem to. Um, but let's go back to the barony theory. State Collins stuff about barons. In England, because I think it's going to this explained a lot to me that I never got before I read parts of Colin's dissertation. Well, in. Uh, before, like the Magna Carta was a thing and it was kind of like a, a settlement between the king and the barons and there's like uh, and well, I should I should get back. Uh, there are competing barons and the king can be thought of kind of as a baron, but a very powerful one. And he's part of why he's up there is he's um, placed himself in on kind of a choke point of um, part of the, the ability to mint coins. And why, why is there so much, why is there such an intense focus on getting metal for yourself through the system of mints. Um, not coins, but mostly metal. Um, why is there this sort of like liquidity preference, you could call it in modern terms? Um, well, it's because you can do a lot of a lot more a lot more with the metal than you could with just a pile of coins. Like uh, there's not really a lot of there weren't really a lot of taxes to pay, hardly at all. Like, like the taxes just weren't imposed really, which is a problem for Dasan. Uh, there, there's like a few tariffs here and there, but like the, the king seemed to want the metal in order in an undifferentiated state, in order to have kind of this option with a value that could be used to pay soldiers. Be it could be transformed into coins to pay soldiers, to protect the king from a civil war. If they needed to, it could be used to pay off Viking raiders uh, in metal form, more most likely, probably most assuredly. Um, it could be used to facilitate trade to get uh, capital goods that you don't yet have the ability to make yourself. 
I mean, it's weird to think about capital goods in feudal terms, but um, this was a thing. Um, it's a way to uh, there's kind of a value between the coin form of the money and the undifferentiated metal form of the money that forms this sort of spread right against which uh, <laughs> the side of being either very, very trustworthy of you or otherwise respecting the power imbalance and we'll take your coins he does not really need the coins and that kind of that would kind of seem to slot into some of the chartalist stuff about like oh it doesn't matter like i mean they just issue it and they don't need their own money it sort of seems similar to that but it's not because there's this dual track system whereby you need um part of the why the king wants to have metal and not the coins is because it get, gives him more leverage to possibly defend himself against like a civil war uprising or something from the barons. Yeah. So, so to build on that, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that any given coin in the economy, right? It's worth, let's say 10 of itself here in our local economy. Why is it worth 10 of itself? Because it's defined in the accounting system by law as worth 10 of itself. But it might be worth 12 of itself abroad because abroad, the coin, nobody cares about what the legal system of, you know, of the country that issued the coin is. They only care about its metal content. And if, for example, silver, like as a commodity, its price goes up so that like that weight that's in the H coin actually is worth like 12. Now, this coin is actually worth more as silver than it is as um as uh as as a coin right like in terms of its like legal value now if there's a situation like that people are liable to melt it because it's worth more so they're so usually kings are going to try to like you know not have it be like that right but that shows the spread that tends to exist usually it's the other way around like if if the system's functioning properly like you know it'll have like um It'll either be worth like exactly as much of itself, or actually the legal system will have like a slight advantage because like you know it'll be like worth eight legally, but it's only got like six uh, six coins worth of silver in it. Um, so it gives you more purchasing power domestically than abroad. But that's called debasement, and that gives an advantage to the king as right. opposed to anyone who's carrying around their currency. And I say advantage because as Steve was saying. A great deal of what's really going on here is that like how much silver is in any given coin determines how much that coin can purchase abroad. So what what are these things that you want to buy from abroad? Well, anything not produced in your region. Exactly. But that can be mercenaries, right. for example which is a very big part of war throughout this entire thousand year period that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Or it just can paying also someone off. That's right. Like just, somebody just paying an aggressor off to leave. Yeah. That's exactly right. Absolutely. So this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. And then, of course, like luxury imports, right? Like, you know, exotic spices and, you know, beautiful, like, you know, uh, te textiles and for, for luxurious clothes and all this other stuff, um, The uh, which might be superficial or it might actually play into someone's like power play because if somebody is much richer and like much more like doing a lot more conspicuous consumption than the king that might actually be a threat to their legitimacy um or it could be part of a power play you know and that kind of thing so this is the yeah. kind of dynamic yeah. that you have to get in order to understand like what the king is doing with the taxes because like chartalism says well the taxes are just a way of driving the use of the coins the king has all the coins that he needs because he's the one who issues them, which is not true in this period, but we'll get to that later. Um, the, you know, he issues coins so that they circulate biophysical resources and people use them because they have to pay the taxing coins and that's why they use the coins. That's like, you know, one aspect of the very origin of coins. But by the time that you get to a system like England, like England is embedded within this larger trade system where metal, especially uh, gold and silver, are used as an international means of payment. So in that context, like 
the king doesn't have all the metal that he needs, right? The king, just like anybody else, has to import based on how much gold and silver he has. So often the, the, the predominance of the evidence is, and it's kind of a lot to get into, so um, I don't want to get like super into it, but there's basically a lot of evidence that what the English kings were trying to do when they collected taxes is actually a lot like what mainstream economics says that they're trying to do. They were taxing in order to spend, but they weren't taxing in order to get coins that they lacked. They could, in principle, have as many coins as they want if they make the coins out of whatever, right? They were taxing in order to get the metal, you see, because the metal is what they use to get the imports. But now there's a whole politics about who has more metal. Is it the king who has more metal or is it the Duke of Gloucester or the Duke of whatever, the, the, the Viscount of whatever bullshit, right? Because that's like, <laughs> yeah, you can tell I, I know a lot of our, um, you know, the, 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 the feudal system, but, 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 you know, cause, cause that's the thing, right? Is that like the, the politics domestically then becomes about like, who has control over the, the the silver and the gold that you use for these imports. So like, okay, oh, here's, here's one good bit. And this is what Steve was saying that the, 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 some evidence that, that this, uh, that tax receivability isn't what the taxes were doing in, in, in this period. Um, there, the aristocracy was barely taxed at all. Like theoretically what would drive the use of their currency was that like, you know, once a year, they would have to pay their tax to the king. But for vast periods of, of several hundred years at a time, there wouldn't be like this like little annual tax like that. There would be like, for at least like not for like, you know, most lords, which is the people who are using like most of the currency. It would be like, you know, there would be like a tariff on like, you know, some common luxury good, for example. Or there would be like, you know, a... um the the but but like for the most part it was like hugely political to for the king to get any of like everyone was basically getting like you know some coins through the minting system which we're avoiding describing because we want to describe it separately but like you know or or some coins through like um through 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 feudal tithes from like you know like merchants and artisans who were like within their territory and then they'd have to pay a tax to the lord locally but the politics of the king taxing the other lords was like horrendous it was very very difficult for the king to be able to get those direct um direct taxes for many many hundreds of years at a time which means it was also difficult for the kings to get a lot of stuff from peasants because they're under the purview of the lords and the barons, right? So, right. and I, I think I can help you out with a couple of historical examples. And you, by explaining what Colin is onto, just made me realize something about the 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 Roman third century crisis. I'll come back to it in a minute. So, in the in Anglo-Saxon England, under the law of Ethelbert, um, we you know from like basically from like say. 597 ish to 1066 um th th there's mention of taxes but taxes are mostly fines for judicial cases uh paid directly to the king fines for minting um and do, 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 and customs duties now to me right. this is interesting if you're arguing under the neo chartalist thing you know that that uh, most of this is about internal trade to pay taxes internally. That system makes no sense. Right. Um, you have one tax that that uh, was a land tax, which again would have only applied to lords, um, and it was only collected for a very brief period of time called the geld. And it was only, like I said, it was only collected from like. 10 12 to about say 1160 so the normans collected for about 100 years um and that's it you don't have anything like property taxes until almost the 12th century so so again you have to look at these very early states with very fun high function uh, central authorities but are not really connected to large external trade networks because they don't exist yet right and if you, in so much they do exist, they're between churches, not polities. Well, actually, I that I would push back on. 
I think Britain was actually integrated into a very extensive international trade network. Um, it, it, I mean, obviously the old Mediterranean trade network had collapsed, but by the time that you get to well, oh, no, I'm, I'm talking about like we're talking about deep history here and going and making the contrast to this time period. Oh, Britain's sorry. trading all the way down to stuff getting into the Islamicate world, and we know that yeah, okay, yeah, these countries have okay. like sorry, like sorry. I mentioned it all the time. In Mercia, they're sorry. printing they're printing coins with Arabic on them. <laughs> like, yeah. which why would yeah. you do that? Yeah. Like it within within uh within Mercia, no one cares. They don't know what it means. Gotcha. Uh, also, I have one last thing. I know I've been babbling a lot, but there's one last point that just to supplement what Varn just said that's really, really important about like, okay, like just to hammer home how much what Varn and Steve are saying is true about like the, the, the tariffs as opposed to like a regular tax. Like that's from a position of weakness because the king could not impose that tax. The way you know that is because when an emergency would happen, like a war with France, like the Hundred Years' War, the king would have to call a special assembly of the lords just in order to beg them for money at this particular juncture. Like, yes, the king's own coins, but specifically metal coins, right? Metal, because the king needs metal for this emergency. That's what a parliament is. That, that, that's what a parliament is. That's what parliament is. Like all these parliamentary systems that we had before they were a democratic republic system, that parliaments were these like basically groups of lords getting together where the king would beg them for money in an emergency. But they didn't have to give it to him. They could say no. And in fact, they often did. And this whole back and forth is exactly what started the English Civil War. It's like no less important of an event than that. And I would say, I would add to that, that part of the reason why imposing tariffs was just wasn't done that much is because of baron, baronal, baronet? baronal maneuvering. Yeah, baronial. Yeah. Baronial maneuvering such that to impose to impose a tariff w in a way that was seen as just willy nilly or too frequent or too onerous was met with some type of force or withholding of resources. So this is what I realized when you guys were explaining this to me about the crisis of the third century, and I know it's not in your paper, but it's consistent with it. In the crisis of the third century, you have a bunch of things happening at once. You have them running out of silver and gold, but you also have a series of civil wars. So the central authority no longer has the authority to enforce currency on large parts of the polity. And a lot of Rome, uh, a lot of the internal, a lot, not just the external trade networks break down in the third century. So do the internal ones. Um, and there is an increased distrust of debased of debased currency. And that makes sense why that would matter, because if the central authority is weakening, um, they can't and there's not necessarily you don't know who the emperor is or who you're actually paying Roman taxes to it. The, the having the metal, which has some value in this international trade network. Now, again, people think we're saying the value is equal. There's nothing like now where you have a set foreign exchange. But that's because of the inability of information transfer. Like, like if you're in China and you're getting something that is coming imported all the way from like Morocco, which did happen, um, and it's going to go through Constantinople, pass back into Europe and then go back into the Silk Road, the exchanges will probably happen a bunch. And there's no set value in each area for the gold. But because the gold is convertible into something else, it has a value in each Polity, which you can't say for every single trade item, and so it can be it can be fairly standardized, even though there's no set international standard exchange. Set international standard exchanges start to develop, I think, at the end of medieval periods. But this is actually sort of what the tally when people talk about tally sticks, they were asking about that, and I was like, well, tally sticks have a long history, but but you see them in the medieval period, so they can figure out uh, kind to coinage to weight in the medieval period. That's kind of what they seem to be measuring. Um, and they talk about them in the Roman Empire in the same time. Now they have completely different uses for just internal credit and other time periods, we think. And we have bone evidence going back like 40,000 years of tally. Oh, yeah. But I just, it just occurred to me because the central authority would be weak at this time period too in the third century. And so the debasement of the coinage would actually matter. All right. 
Now, it doesn't mean that like the currency wasn't debased before then, but, so, but the debasement of the currency really does matter there because there's no central authority for which has the taxing capacity in this time period for you to be able to count that this debased currency is going to be payable for anything you need or even payable to the emperor. Right. And that's important. And I think that actually makes the crisis of the third century make sense in a way that I could never reconcile with um, hmm. traditional MMT. And I'm just figuring this out on the fly as we're talking. So, like, I'm just thinking about stuff because this is what I know about money that counter to the MMT story is the crisis of the third century. I actually didn't know this barren stuff, but it, 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 it totally makes sense because it's a parallel situation where the central power is weak. The ability to tax is weak because of civil wars. And there's a lot of mercenaries going around and not just are your external, basically your internal trade routes start acting like external trade routes, even within the country. So like, yeah, stuff is good within a city, Right. But outside the city, and, and these small cities in, in, mm -hmm. in antiquity cannot produce enough to sustain their populations in a lot of cases. So, like, that's a problem, like, immediately for money. And that actually is what prompts the shifts onto manors, manorial states, and particularly added, adding in tax avoidance to that. Because um, this becomes a problem, too, as tax avoidance of the Roman Empire. That leads to the shift to the, to the manor system in some areas overstated that it happens everywhere in the medieval period by the way um to to feudalism or what we would call feudalism kind of colloquially because feudalism is not one thing and i don't want to get into that debate in the chat um so i think this i think when you add this barren picture it really does explain why why they hold on to metal metal in particular for so long all right um and that's important to me. I hope I hope Colin finishes his uh, book and he says I should come to his uh, Rome seminar because I'm guessing he covers a lot of this in much more detail. Um, so let's get back to the barons. We got the, we got the barony period. We got all this period with low taxation. Well, this taxation, as we think about it, I'm just it just again, I'm just playing with my Anglo-Saxon history. And again, I know it. OK. You don't see the property tax until like the 12th century. Well, that's when the Normans have established a strong central kingship on the island of Britain, right? So, so that makes sense that they can now tax property in, in a way that they could not before. But again, if you're assuming that money is all explained by these internal transactions with a, uh, with a, song, a strong central state and that money is always fiat currency, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, and none of this is to say that the credit relations within these polities that were developing was somehow unimportant, or like uh, that we should oh, we should just scrap all that and focus upon metal content of coins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just to integrate both of them together into a story that is makes sense with the historical evidence. It's like right, there were so there were there were tally, tally six existed. Um, right. So do they, so, do they explain yeah. international trade or conflicts between barons and kings? No, they don't. Not at all. Well, I mean, and, one of the one of the things I just want to add to that. So, for internal to England in the Anglo-Saxon period, the major tax is food rent. But it's food rent. It's actually in this time in this time period, it's payment in kind. It's it's not. It right. is a it is a debt at credit relation like you'd expect. It's not anything to do with taxation of money when this. It, well, I shouldn't say anything. I'm probably overstating it, and Colin will definitely correct me in the show notes if I overstate it. But, but I know that like the food rent seems to be what commoners dealt with, and it was paid to lords, not to the king, I believe. Uh, well, indirectly to the king because food rents was also collected from the king from the lords. Okay, so let's get back on back to barons. So I think that the, um, to kind of like get back to, now that you kind of know some of the dynamics, some, there's, we've, we've kept it to the simple ones because there's other moving parts in the system. But now that you know like the basic dynamics of how like inside versus outside money, domestic currency versus Forex works under a coin system where any given unit of currency is at the same time a unit of domestic money and a unit of Forex, depending on whether you're using it for domestic or international payments. Now that you kind of like 
get that and therefore get why like the king wants to get taxes uh coins in taxes because he wants to get the metal of the coins so that he can have more import power than other competing powers like the church or his barons now that you get this basic kind of dynamic the question is does this theory which is you know Collins' theory of the barons and the coins, and also, you know, our our theory of forex. It's 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 our theory of forex is kind of in a way like a general abstraction that kind of encompasses both like the contemporary twentieth century moment and this coin system and the Mesopotamian system. We think, or at least that's that's what we would like to give ourselves credit for 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 thinking. Um, so here's the question: Which one makes better predictions about British history? If we just stick to English history. Um, like, which one makes better predictions? Dasan's orthodox neo-chartalism, um, with this kind of, like, emphasis on basically only the legal, uh, juridical and kind of, like, chartalistic aspects of money, or alternatively, um, you know, our kind of, like, forex theory. I think that we have to actually then look at particular historical scenarios and then kind of, like, see how Dasan, um, uh, treats them and then kind of see like, okay, does Dasan's treatment of this specific historical scenario make sense? Because it's worth giving Dasan credit where it's due to her, right? Like she, unlike almost all the other neo-chartalists, I mean, certainly Ray, certainly Kelton, um, certain, certainly Mitchell, like none of those economists ever want to talk about anything except Bronze Age Mesopotamia way over here. And then they'll like, Talk about like coins, but only as tax receivability. They'll never talk about why they were made of metal. And then they'll skip the thousand years where metal coins were like, you know, the most prominent kind of currency. And then they'll go to like colonial paper money in the Americas, in the British colonies. And then they'll be like, see, our theory of money explains everything. It's like, well, not really, because you just have this like giant gap here where the system doesn't work the way that you want. And then they also don't talk about outside Eurasia very much. So the sun takes on the problem period directly, which is why like assessing her treatment of that period is so important because it would show if the theory really holds up under stress. And I mean, Dasan does a lot of decent work as a legal historian and there's a lot of really interesting stuff in her books and they're really cool. And I recommend that people read them, but the answer kind of is no, there's good reason to believe that she gets a lot wrong precisely because she's looking at her neo chartalism So one thing that she gets wrong, the fall of Rome. So if you listen to um, a podcast like Patrick Wyman's fall of Rome podcast, or read like the dissertation that it's based on, you know, like, you'll know that like, the fall of the Roman Empire was this kind of protracted process, which leads a lot of people to think like to nowadays to argue like, well, you know, like Rome didn't really fall, it was just a long process of decline of transformation or whatever. Wyman and other people of his ilk are like, no, 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 Rome really fell because the international trade system, which basically kept the empire together as a single unitary cultural system across the Mediterranean, collapsed. And it was the reversion to this kind of localism um, in different areas. Now, in some places, this was not that traumatic. They just adapted in a relatively whatever way. In Britain, it was actually quite severe. It went from like a very monetized and urbanized economy to basically like a, almost for a little bit, a totally, or like, you know, or like 60% demonetized uh, economy. Um, it seems like there was like a reversion to some gift economy stuff. Um, Roman coins do, uh, don't seem to have like, you know, circulated for, again, in the immediate kind of aftermath of the fall um, in the, uh, Oh, I suck with centuries. I suck at history. You know, <laughs> here we are writing this history and I always forget the years, but um, I, I think we're talking like a seventh, eighth century. I hope I didn't, I didn't screw. Maybe it's, it's maybe it's eighth and ninth actually. Yeah. So somewhere in that neighborhood, the, uh, the, but, but anywho, somebody will correct me in the comments, but the point is like in these like immediate centuries after the, the, the fall of Rome, um, you, you have this like heavily demonetized economy where people are, uh, and, and Dasan talks about it. 
She, the old Roman coins still circulated, but they were used as like jewelry or commodities or weights rather than as money. And, uh, quote, some bronze Roman coinage may have been used locally. So, there, you know, there were little bits of, of the place where it might have been used as currency still, but for the most part, you were getting like gift economy type stuff. Um, if you want to know what a gift economy is, watch part one of this interview. Uh, the, so, the, the the gist of it, though, is that, like, okay, how did Britain get its money back? And Dasan purports to explain it with recourse to this model, which is very much like a, um, a charterless model. And it seems to me like she's basing it off of the Mesopotamian temples, which are, like, an empirically real thing. But... It's kind of like this weird theory where she says that there was like this stakeholder who enters the picture. This is how the Britons apparently got money back after after the fall of Rome. Supposedly, there's this stakeholder who's like this, quote, small ruler who led communities often related by birth or loyalty in return for tribute in labor, produce and military service. So according to Dasan, you have these like warlords and would be petty kings who need to mobilize resources in the territories that they control and they reinvent money. But she makes it sound like it was this like very like benign process where like they're like the most important community stakeholder. And so everybody agrees to pay them tribute. And it kind of like, because she's very interested in like a story that kind of ties to the 20th century where state money is public money, which is under democratic control and is fiat. And gold is like, you know, the money of like the elites who have like, you know, commercial relations um, abroad and are more interested in like their own wealth than in public spending. And then that's why they want to do austerity. But in the interest of forwarding that dichotomy, she kind of like creates this idea of like the stakeholder who's like the core of the community. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore like they can invent money because everybody gives them tribute and that accounting system by which they measure the tribute ends up being like the, the, the money that circulates. So that's problem. Number one is that like, okay, that's a very benign way of talking about like warlords going around and conquering people. And, you know, to the credit of the MMTers, there are MMTers who are more realistic about this, like Matthew Forstadter, for instance, who talks about like, you know, the real way that monetary systems were imposed upon non-monetary peoples in the colonial periphery in the early modern period in Africa, the French would basically use it as a way of doing forced conscript labor. And that's a very different, you know, uh, that's a very different thing, except that Forstadter is actually talking about a real thing that happened. Dasan it's, she doesn't really talk about like real things when she's talking about the stakeholder theory. She's talking about this like abstract thing. Um, the 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 other aspect of it, and then I'll shut up. I promise. Is the um, she has this notion that the stakeholder has a problem with getting payments in kind, and this is really unrealistic and kind of bizarre. Um, you know, she she has this notion that like the the stakeholder doesn't always get what they need at the time that they need it so like the the you know like like oh i'm gonna do a tax and you can pay in chickens or grain but then like you know somebody is like oh well i don't have um you know it's like it's like well all i have for you is this is is this chickens thing uh, sorry i actually to be honest it's actually like very confusing so i have to actually like remind myself of how it worked but it, it she basically is like um uh, trying to talk about like like why you would have tally sticks because she is trying to account for the tally sticks as if the tally sticks were the origin of British money and in fact the tally sticks were not the origins of British money so she makes up this whole story about how um, and I, I confess I actually have to look it up again because it's actually like very very confusing to me so I might have to get back to you on this um well, somebody talks about something else, but the the gist of it is that she kind of like like does a very unrealistic version of that story um, in order to kind of make the talistics work as the origins of money. But in fact, the Brits, when they start using money again, they start using metal coins like almost immediately because they didn't forget the metal coin international payment system that they were a part of. And in fact, as an island, they wanted to get plugged into it right away. So they not only issued coins, but they issued coins with a high metal content 
in order to make sure that any coin that they issued had great purchasing power abroad so that they could always secure the kind of imports that they need as an island um, with trade partners like France and even as far as field as like, you know, the Near East. So, but I will look up the, the song thing in a second. <laughs> right. So like England, partially owing just to its unique geo geologic, like geographical situation is like just from that reason alone they're going to be a trade heavy small island nation which is going to want to get the metal content of its coins up more than most other um polities rulers might and like for literally centuries they're just like <laughs> obsessing over um maintaining a very high metal content in their coins and um Dasan's explanation of it um, is I'm glad that she's treating this thousand peri thousand year period where MMTers just totally passed over. But um, it doesn't it just doesn't really explain. She's trying to make it into the the tally sticks origin point and that it's the stakeholder system, not unlike the world economics. World Economic Forum's stakeholder capitalism theory of today, by the way, where there's like various elements of society are coming together sort of ex nihilo in order to impose credit obligations with one another because of the total collapse that she's kind of assuming assuming happened in these communities of, of the, the Roman coinage and like a, a lack of specie to, to facilitate trade for them. And I just, we just, um, we don't see that in the evidence. Yeah, I, I found the thing, by the way. Sorry, mm -hmm. it was bothering me because um, the, so here's basically Dasan's theory. I'm quoting from our essay. I'm just going to read it straight. Um, the, because I think it's more eloquently put here than I could do in paraphrase. So Dasan's theory in our words is you, the sovereign, right? You're the stakeholder and you've got, people already like doing payments in kind to you and you've got some kind of accounting system by which to track that so far so chartalist however you the sovereign may demand payment in kind measured in some accounting system but you may not get what you need at the time you need it so supposedly whenever you get something early right like like oh um you know, I have some grain now, but I'm not going to have it later. So I'm going to give it to you now, sovereign stakeholder person. Um, or here, you can have my chicken now. I know you don't need it right now, but like, you know, here, here it is. So it's not, we're not talking about like fixed payments at intervals. We're talking about like people giving you the tribute on this rolling basis whenever they've got what they have and it may not be what you need. So you ingeniously come up with the idea of giving a token to this person who is giving you the payment, you know, early before you need it um and then this token represents the unit of account value of their payment so let's say that it's like oh you gave me a chicken okay this is worth like a, a five value tally stick so here take the tally stick and then that's that's the you know and then when it is tax time all these people who already paid you early for some unexplained reason they can like come in and they can pay you the token that you gave them because uh because they already paid directly in biophysical resources before. And then they, you know, when, because this is the case, people will use the token. It's like a tax receivability story, but kind of like in this weirdo reverse way, like, you know, that guy that you gave the token to, somebody else might want his token. So they'll pay him something so they can get his token so they don't have to pay the tax or something. I don't like even that. understand this. Like I, what I, evidence I, do we have for the I, system I, ever existing? And here's the thing. It never did. Like, the reason why I forgot about this is because it's so gonzo that it's like you don't see it anywhere. And in fact, in the book where um, she talks about this, which is her chapter of um, money in the Western legal tradition from the Middle Ages to Bretton Woods, that's a, that's a group collection, one of these academic group collections. And she wrote this essay in it called Money as a Legal Institution. It's very well cited in some parts. But when she talks about the stakeholder theory – like the citations disappear because it's this abstract schema. So why the hell would she, you look at the history and that's never how tally sticks were used. In fact, tally sticks didn't actually circulate as currency at all. They were used. Right. They're really weird to use as currency. They're kind of big. Right. 
Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a credit instrument, right? It's a credit. It's, it's not circulating. It's a credit instrument, and it's an accounting instrument. And it also, the ones that I've seen from England in this time period, mention currency in metal. Right. Yeah. There you go. They, they would be presented to the Bank of England much later, much much later, right? And to extinguish debts, and you could uh, you could conceivably get some coins out of transactions using uh, these credit instruments, but that was not, that's not what we're talking about in the Dasan story right now. Right. That's way later. Right. The, the, what, but I'm saying like the early medieval things that I'm seeing, they mention they mention things. It's like you, this is worth, this chicken is worth this much currency, which amounts to this much metal. And it's mm -hmm. there on the stick, right? Like that's what's there. Right. You wouldn't trade that. That doesn't make any sense to actively <laughs> trade. Like, like it's it would you'd like write it down. You trading this many chickens. That's worth this much gold. You don't have to pay that gold. You don't have it. Like this explains the medieval like when people paid in kind stuff, and that is a form of credit money. But it it's it's not a currency. Like, and and here's the thing is that like, you know, I. I have read about how tally sticks works worked and then forgotten about it basically. So I'm going to garble the details, but my broad understanding is that tally sticks were always used specifically as a way of like adjudicating individual relationships between the, sorry, as a way of adjudicating relationships between individual taxpayers and the central government, like where there was like some kind of lag between when they could pay and when they couldn't. And then that was, and then that was it. They didn't like circulate as currency. And they also were not the primary way in which people could pay taxes, even when they were paying taxes in kind, because think about it in order to make it so that tally sticks were the origins of money. And they were this generally circulating thing that everybody had to use. If that's the case, then like you have to invent this whole story for why the King or the central the central stakeholder or whatever is receiving these payments like early, like before they need them in order to issue these sticks. And like that story is like highly artificial and BS because we know from Mesopotamia that if you just put an obligation that's like once a year, um, you can just like get the grain because it's usually grain or some other food thing that in an agrarian society, most peasants grow. You can just get that once a year and then you the, the, you know what? You have an accounting system already, so everybody owed this. Oh, you paid? Okay, good. Boom. Done. Th that's all you need. You don't need this like secondary ancillary system to do that. And we know this because the example that the chartalists always like, the Mesopotamian one, basically already does this. And in fact, part of the motivation for Dasan here is that she's trying to come up with a chartalist story for how money was reinvented in Britain. Where she, where she, oh yes, yeah, Steve, go ahead. If she wants to like repeat the shekel system almost. Yes, except there's a problem. In Mesopotamia, money wasn't invented all at once. You had the shekel system, which was a pure accounting system, and that, and it was just an accounting system for doing payments in kind. And then hundreds and hundreds of years later, you had people issuing coins made of metal circulating them and receiving them back in order to like mobilize resources. So this is like the, the this is like the 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 hundreds of years apart. For Dasan, she has to explain a period where people were briefly doing payments in kind, but then very quickly go back to a coinage system. So she basically has them go through like the shekel system, but then like very quickly invent a circulating thing. And it's tally sticks, which actually in real life had a totally orthogonal purpose that doesn't have anything to do with this. But she tries to make it kind of all work, all with basically like zero case studies of actual cases. Because if you do look at the actual cases, you see a very different thing. And this is kind of where Colin's work has come really in handy, because he points out that not only was Britain back on coins, but like all other powers that were part of this like, you know, international payment system rooted in metal, they would set the amount of metal in their coins to some fixed proportion of the amount of metal that was in other people's coins who were their main trade partners. So like 
they not only know how to use coins, but they're like explicitly setting it so that you can immediately swap three of these for one of these, you know, like, you know, let's say three francs for one English sovereign. Um, I'm making this up, so this is not real exchange rates, but this is just to give you an idea. Um, and what that allows you to do is no longer be worrying about lumps of metal and carrying them around with you. For the most part, if you're states, you can just do like, you know, um, uh, uh, transactions between coins. You can exchange them coins for coins uh, based on their relative metal contents. Now there's still like, you know, metal, the price of metal is still important because like, you know, in, there's, there's like merchants carrying around raw metal and other stuff like that. And there's also like the minting system to get coins in the first place requires the raw metal to be transformed into coins, which is like a whole process. Um, and in fact, maybe we can head there next because that's another thing that Dasan kind of gets wrong, but this gives you a sense of like, you know, Dasan's trying to make the theory work so that like money does everything that MMT says it would do in a time period where just, it doesn't explain anything that actually happened. You have to create this kind of fantasy scenario for it to, for it to be the case. It seems like the sun's working backwards from like the Royal tally system, which leads to the bank of England back into like the medieval period to make it look like this ancient money systems that like Hudson and people write about. Right. Like, is that what I'm getting here? That there's a working backwards and kind of a just so story to make the backwards push of these being used to something like, you know, more official credit instruments than like credit instruments with exchange tallies on them between, you know, uh, I, I mean, the reason why I say that is like, yes, it's to a state, but there's also the fact that lords are like semi state lords and barons and dukes and whatnot are semi states, um, or like states within states in, in, in the manorial system. So it's the, like the, the, even the, I don't like talking about states in medieval in medieval Europe actually because it's misleading. Um, but um, I mean, there's a government, but it's not a state like we think about it. And in many ways, the modern state and these ancient empire imperial states are more similar than the things that come in between. Um, which is for those of you who don't know, I do an entire podcast on the transition from Rome to early medieval as a comparative from the transition to uh, to capitalism. Like that's the reason why I study it. And um, this seems like you're taking something from like the 1600s and, and also it didn't work the way it's being described there even then and reading it back in time because they did use a thing called a Cali stick that did a thing that was a credit instrument. Um, all the way back, you know, to these ancient societies that also had tally sticks because they're easy recording methods. Um, I mean, like the Chinese used them for more than this. This they wrote whole books on the things um, before the invention of paper. So, like, like that's how we have the Confucian classics, people. So it was just like a, it was like it's like papyrus reads. I'm not making a theory of papyrus reads about how money works, and. And what's interesting to me about this is the other time periods that, that you focus on that do have this kind of charterless condition of money are conscript labor in Africa and then um, stuff in the colonial in the colonial period where they just don't have access to things, right? Like there's just not enough metal and <laughs> and like they're not and, and the trade's mostly internal anyway, et cetera, and so forth. So so how do we get to, to the beginnings of modern money? I know we don't fully get off the gold, the gold, you know, gold as a standard of international exchange for a long time, but how do we start transitioning to banknotes and paper money according to your theory? Well, I think before that, I, I, I we should go through a couple more of the kind of like descriptions of the system as it existed then. Through okay. in Dasan. Just because just because I think it's really important to see like the way that she sees it versus the way that we see it. And okay. that answers the question eventually, because because then we get to like the, the end of it, which is like the transition to the paper money and gold standard thing. Um the uh, I think that the uh you said something about the um uh, uh, ah, crap. You, you said something that I was gonna 
remark on, and then I just uh, is it about tally yeah. sticks in the formation of the National Bank of England in sixteen hundred. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Right. There we go. So I think that the thing with the tally sticks, just to wrap that up, is that Dasan is using a system that she does understand. This is the key thing for me. I think mm. that the deep motivation of her explanation there is that she's using a system that she does understand, which is the Mesopotamian temple system, and trying to impose it on a situation that she's trying to understand in a way that just doesn't work. And this is a pattern that you'll that we'll see in a couple of other different aspects. Um, so, for example, it's it's actually more clear in the minting system. Before we get to the minting system, my favorite is uh, the, co the the coin shortage. So, mm -hmm. so Britain throughout its history, remember they're trying to do like high metal content in the coins, right? So throughout its history, they have this like horrible problem, which. Um, the monetary historian Glenn Davies, among other people, points out is that England never has enough coins circulating. Like, there's just not like enough. Money. Yeah, exactly. Like, like for like a thousand years, there's just not enough money in the British economy. Like, like for all the transactions that they wanna that they wanna execute, there's like frequent monetary shortages, um, and that kind of limits the growth of economic activity. And you can tell, you know, if if you're like a Keynesian, you believe in effective demand. And that's, um, you know, if, 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 if in a monetized production economy, you need money to do stuff, but there's just not enough money going around, there's not enough money for people to start businesses and pay people and like, you know, do, and, and pay for shipments and do, do all these other different kinds of things. So economic activity, like, you know, will expand up to a certain point and then just kind of like, you know, stagnate or shrink, um, you know, and there'll be unemployment if it's a wage labor economy and all the other stuff. So there's like this constant, constant, constant problem of this. If you want to have an account of British monetary history, you got to have an account of what causes it. The sun basically has the gist of the facts of what happens because she knows that it has to do with the fact that it's coins as opposed to paper. And she knows that it has to do with them being commodity money, the dual nature of coins as not just like, you know, a legal amount of, of of their worth, however much in the legal system, but they also are made of a particular weight of precious metal. Um, but her way of describing it is very confusing because she describes a system where people are like constantly whittling away at the coins, and it's like they're they're destroying the nation's currency, and it's just like unclear why that happens so like you know it's supposed to be this miracle whereas a beautiful process of circulation quote when content and form netted out to a value in coin after coin that people were happy to give and take but then that process is interrupted by people taking a literal chunk out of the coins and then this is a blog quote from the song coins in use wore down and got clipped losing silver or gold content the markets for those metals shifted, changing the value of silver pennies against gold denominations. Sovereigns competed for bullion supplies by raising the prices they offered at their mints. As the commodity value of coins that offered the same count began to differ, old and new pennies, whole and clipped coins, silver and gold cognates, the people holding them began discriminating among them, hoarding or melting some and passing others off by face value. Their actions subverted the coins' circulation. So you can tell that she's getting a little like poetic and like high theoretical in this, in this passage. And she's getting the facts right. Oftentimes there wasn't enough coins. Well, she's kind of getting it right. She's noting something that really happens is the way I would put it. The, the, she, people will often take a chunk out of the coins um, and do so illegally. And she claims that that, is be, that that action then subverts the coin circulation. And then she kind of leaves it at that. I mean, she goes on for a bit about this, but like, you know, for the, for the most part, that's her explanation for why there's not enough coins going around. Okay. So we notice a coin shortage, but the issue that we have is not her description of the coin shortage. It's that her description sneaks in an interpretive framework that you really have to read closely to notice that she's doing, correct? Am I, am I understanding your criticism of this passage correctly? Well, I would say... Well, yeah, go ahead. She's she's noting certain like specific historical things that really did happen, but like you're getting it, it she's imposing a 
an old monetary union which didn't exist onto in a way that just like sort of on the sly gives us this chartless emerging chartless story out of like uh what seemed like like using real developments to try and get us into a uh, more of a chartless framework that's exactly right steve she has this she has this notion that the king centrally issuing which we're as we're about to see never happens <laughs> that's not that's not how the issuance of the coins <laughs> <It never happens. laughs> but but it's like the king who has like this like you know he, this responsibility or this desire to issue the coins that circulate through the realm and give it the liquidity that it needs it's like they're being subverted by these mysterious agents who are coming in and cutting out bits of the coin and therefore not allowing the public money to circulate to the extent necessary. So you have mm. these like evil elites who have the metal, who want the metal for their nefarious purposes. And then you have like the ideal, not yet realized, but somehow still something that, you know, in some primeval medieval past, everyone understands that money can be infinite, right? Like, but it's being, it's being interrupted in this way. And, you know, there's two issues with this. One is that people did take melt the king's coins down, particularly when they either lost faith in the government and wanted to act against it, right? And or the the international markets for the metals fluctuated in such a way that, as we were discussing before, the thing goes up compared to the nominal value, so it's more profitable to, um, you know, to to as in its metal value than it is in its nominal value. And you can like arbitrage that the uh, actually, sorry, I should have started with the other thing first. Cause actually that's the more important thing. Like the more important thing here is that like, as Glenn Davies uh, says, England was obsessed with maintaining a high silver content in their coins. This is what like she Dasan misses because she acts as if like the central government is like, you know, it could just as easily issue paper money, but for some reason they don't. And then there's like these bad actors who take the metal as a result. But in fact, the central government was obsessed, as were most of the aristocrats for that matter, with a high silver content in their coins. But there's only so much silver in the economy. So like, you know, they can't expand their currency issuing capabilities sufficiently to meet the demand of the economy if there's so much silver in each coin. But if they had debased it, then each coin would have less purchasing power, which means that each aristocrat who has his coins has less purchasing power than they would have otherwise. And in this decentralized system, as you can see, that's not really good. So the politics of it drives the high silver content, but the high silver content creates a constant coin shortage, or as Glenn Davies very poetically puts it, Engl England crucified itself on a cross of undebased silver. And you can contrast this with like France, which was debasing its silver all the time in order to expand um, its its uh, its 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 currency issuances for like wars or industrial development. Well, not industrial development, infrastructure development, and things like that. Um, you know, so so th this is like a contrast to the British, who basically, or sorry, the English, who basically like never debased their coins unless they absolutely had to, and when they did, the king became like a loathed figure, right? And so, I mean, like, I, like Newton's job is to hang people for debasing our counterfeiting coining, for example. Like, even like even seven hundred years later. So, yeah, that's so. right. <laughs> and then that's there's... actually, I, I, in researching this with John, I became actually pretty sympathetic to the mercantilists again. After like going through, after going through the MMT experience of like saying like these are the mercantilists they they obsessed over having a high high metal content in coins because i guess they were just stupid or something right to to actually reading the history and realizing oh wait there's lots of operational reasons why they did this right it wasn't just ideology which is which is usually which is by, by problem with mmt in general even now in modern and when we talk about modern stuff when they're like uh, this is ideology why everybody pegs their stuff to the dollar. Really, really, you really yeah. think that? Like, like because you're basically implying that most of the world is stupid when you say that. Um. So, anyway, let's get let's continue. So the 
I actually, uh, I want to follow up on some of the Steve said. I know I keep dragging us back, but it's just like, it's it's really funny with your analyst because there's this one guy, Von Hornick, and we don't talk about it in the Forex essay. We talk about it in the history essay, which is already up. So if you want to see this, check out. Um, history of chartalism, right? Yes, history of chartalism part one. It's a footnote in there in the Friedrich Knopf section. I can't remember what number footnote, but there's this footnote about this guy called Von Hornick, who's like this extremely typical, um, what was called a German cameralist, who's, uh, that's like their version of mercantilism. And uh, mercantilism is basically like centralized state planning to make sure that the state has all the silver. It's a much later development from when states became much more strong in like the absolutist period in like the 17, 16 and 1700s, which was like the rise of like the modern centralized state. And these modern centralized states were like, fuck the barons. We're not having any more of this bullshit. We will have all the silver. If you want to come into this country, you have to give us a huge proportion of your silver. If you want to do this transaction, you give us all the silver. Oh, you want like gold money? Too bad. Here's paper money. It's like, you know, like, and then we keep all the silver for the, for the Forex and you only get it if, if we, if we let you, I mean, this is, this is, it differs from system to system. Sometimes they're not able to impose this, but the Germans in particular were like obsessed with, with this. And von Hornick, who's, um, one of the big cameras thinkers in Germany is like so obsessed with like producing exports to get more silver and never using silver for imports that he goes on this enormous tirade, which doesn't make any sense if you don't know these dynamics against women. He's like a misogynist against aristocratic women who like pretty dresses. And he's like, these women with their pretty dresses are destroying Germany. <laughs> because, because there's silver in the dresses? <laughs> no, because, because they're imported which requires silver yeah because the, the balance of payments was so poor on the, <laughs> on the pretty dress market okay got it <laughs> so we need they, these women are obsessed with silks made in the netherlands and they're just draining away our silver into the <laughs> netherlands they should buy german dresses and if they say the german dresses aren't as good well damn it they should do so and it's their degeneracy <laughs> that has been ruined you, um yeah so that and thus thus this launched the their bid to become autarkic in pretty dresses. That's absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this gives you a sense of like, this is otherwise kind of inexplicable. It's like, oh, I guess Germans were weird about clothes, but actually it has to do with like the guy trying to promote Germany's textile industry, but then kind of running up against the fact that like there's a, I guess you could call it a comparative advantage thing where the German dresses were, or, sorry, the Dutch dresses were prettier. So people want Dutch dresses. And this is a very, this is a core dynamic. Get rid of gold and silver, get rid of the international means of payment that were dominated at that time. You still have similar dynamics where it's like you, you have a trade off between building up your own industries on the one hand, but then also like, you know, it is nice to have imported goods from abroad that are in the industries that you know like it's okay like it's nice to have a mercedes Benz, right or an audi or or a um or a nintendo 64 right like an xbox is not substitutable for a nintendo switch like the xbox one sucks the nintendo switch is really good sorry <laughs> throwing that out there i know that's you know like so but if you took this like super protectionist attitude of like we have to develop the video games industry in the united states to be the number one you might actually like chastise people for buying switches, right? It's like the buy America, buy yeah. America and America first attitude. So there's there's a little bit of the camera like relentless search to plug balance of payment holes going on with like infant industries later on in the US and whatnot. But um but we shouldn't do what jo what uh what John was saying earlier that that Dasan kind of does where she just imposes her own monetary system from an earlier time in order to explain developments and say like, oh, well, people cared about balance of payments for in this specific operational way, therefore they must do so later. Right. That's that's the important thing. It's an analogy, but it's not a perfect one because there's many different things that change when the international means of payment changes. I mean, one important one, right, is that with a coin, a single unit has purchasing power in both. There isn't much use in debasing a dollar, right? I mean, like, I don't have my wallet. Shave off some of the green. We're going to yeah. shave off some green? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, why would you do that? <laughs> That's stupid. Unless it, well, maybe the chemicals, if you, or 
would be useful in making something else that sells for more money than the money that you debased. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I feel like if that were true, <laughs> if that were true, you would see a lot more of it, right? Material. I mean, yeah. I mean, someone would have already kind of do see it yeah. with pennies because pennies are, are actually worth more in their metal than they. That's are. actually true. That's <laughs> so, <laughs> if you have yeah. pennies, that's it's why true. it's illegal. <laughs> nickel now too, actually. I think it recently became true of the nickel. It's worth more in its weight in the metal than it is in than it is uh, nominally. So you might actually, if you just collect a bunch of pennies and nickels and melt them down, you will so go to prison if someone yeah, figures out you well, did it. But if, um, <laughs> well, that's the truth. It's illegal. Yeah, for that reason. That's why the, the mint. Why the mint legal. has like this heavy duty security force still that's like left over from like the, yeah <laughs> the 1910s this is like almost inexplicable but it was to hunt down people who are maybe thinking about doing this among other things that's right for, for counterfeiting or or to debase coins well i mean we have the secret them. service for counterfeiting but yeah I mean, yeah they're sorry the secret service all the like the mint like various the mint has the police for like going after have security yeah. forces and you wouldn't expect it yeah. <laughs> You got the mint cops. Perhaps you should expect it. There, there might be overlapping <laughs> security jurisdictions, even about this. Like, you like got both the Secret Service and the mint cops can come after no, you. But like this, yeah, the, yeah, there'd be uh, treasury or like there. You, I, I don't want U.S. mint agents coming into my house <laughs> heavily armed because they learned they got tipped off by someone that was melting down nickels. Right, but that makes a lot less sense with paper, right? Um, because like you, it, it, and paper is of course what matters because it's the higher denomination in our system. Um, so there's no, there's none of these like, um, melting down dynamics in our system. We're not usually debasing the currency in order to get some kind of added Forex value because the Forex value comes entirely based on what the exchange rate is with the five reserve currencies, which is something that is just not under our control. It's purely nominal. So it's an interesting system because it's one of the first like really purely nominal international means of payment systems. And that's, so to Steve's point from like five minutes ago, this is a really cool, but also important example of how things don't perfectly translate from period to period. You have to look at the institutional specificity and the operational specificity of each given time period. However, there do seem to be general principles that you can use to generalize, um, the uh, and once you know those general principles and patterns, you can start asking better questions. Like in this time period, how are they making payments internationally? In this time period, what is the relationship between domestic currency and forex? How did they do exchange rates? The, you know, how did they set prices in general? Who controls the institutions of the international means of payment or the exchange rates or whatever? Who set these prices? You can start asking those questions and then do a historical materialist analysis of whatever time period or whatever place you want to be looking at. So, I mean, this matters for things like Warren Mosler's version of MMT, where he claims that almost all prices are set by the buying rate of the federal government, which every time I hear, I try not to laugh at. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it, it, that may be true for, say semi-skilled labor because in any given market the federal government may be the largest employer of semi-skilled labor that's consistent from state to state thus would have a national pay rate that can affect things in different areas where currency would like where, where basically purchasing power is 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 is, is uh, lower or higher depending um but but that's not true for milk um <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's not even really even in the most narrow like for f-22s it's not even really true yeah because and of I, all of the inputs that the government has little if any control over the price of them to that's Lock, right. I mean, lockheed it, it, martin is can control somewhat but the government is not so i, I mean and so i i have heard like more i'm not saying more responsible but different MMTers talk about like spectrums of sovereignty even within the United States where they can't actually do this because one of they did uh, the, the, um, Sam Kanger Lu when he came on and talked about this did actually try to undercut this by mentioning oil and talking about U.S. bargaining for oil but I'm like the U.S. doesn't really bargain for oil so much as it tries to pressure OPEC countries to put oil on the market like. 
Like I guess it does. I guess it may it may be though. I don't know. It may be the largest purchaser of petroleum in the in the United States, but but it's probably not the largest purchaser of petroleum in the world. So I don't know how it can set prices. And now to, gen to yeah. generalize a bit before we get into like our general modern stuff, stuff, yeah. Um, like if okay, if back in medieval England, you could think of the king as a more powerful baron who's established himself uh, militarily or politically above other barons. It's like, okay, is the U.S. government a king in the sense that there are other barons who it has to owe, has to um, pay lip service or actually, or more than that, to uh, become, uh, it has to buy enough F-22 Raptors from from Lockheed, uh, partly as a political gesture. But Lockheed's got to get its its materials from all kinds of countries. But it, like Lockheed countries. has its own supply chains, which are completely outside of the king's uh, right. domain, and um, it has you know it has to deal with that that fact politically, and um, accept prices whatever they might be, uh, as far as like what Lockheed wants. Although I would say, even though everything you just said is true, Steve, I, there's there's a way that you can spin it where it's a contrast too, rather than just a comparison. Because it's also like, you know, if if sovereignty is a spectrum, you could also spin it as sovereignty is a process, right? The process of developing more autonomy from external forces, which includes other agents. So, so. If you see it as that, then like a rich merchant is not yet a state, but their bill of exchange might be something that circulates if people want it for some reason. Because like a Bitcoin. Well, well, that's the thing, right? Like Bitcoin, yes and no, because like yes, it's a speculative asset which now you can use to. Right, to but no, you're not going to price it. in it like it, in any real sense. Priced in it, like right. really, what I'm talking about is more like. You know, Walmart gift cards are desirable because you can use them to buy stuff at Walmart. Which yeah, is a gray market. You can use gift cards in gray market currency, right? Or like, like, let's be honest. Anywhere I go in Latin America, where I can use a dollar without going to an exchange booth, um, right? Which is most of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and and I, I used to point this out because. Because my problem with MMT has always been every example they gave me was Autarkus, meaning it was an enclosed system. And I've just been screaming for years, nothing in the modern economy is an enclosed system. So explain to me why only the imperial powers, particularly the British ones, and people adjacent to it for reasons of historical analogies like Japan and East Asia can do these policies. And nobody else seems to, except for maybe China, who doesn't want to. All right, which is important. I don't, you know, like because they have their reasons not to want to. Like, yeah. um, like, so this this seems important to me because it's like, okay, why is the dollar the reserve currency? Blah, 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 blah. And what I what I continuously get from MMTers. Is like, well, you know, the MMT's answer is like Scotland should be free and have its own national currency. And I'm like, what can Scotland produce in the international market that command Americans to take their money? Like nothing. So, so I'm just maybe there's some really good haggis we want, but haggis is usually illegal in the United States anyway. So I mean, I'm just to be an asshole about it, but I I have actually really thought about this. I thought about this in the Greek crisis, like when they were telling you when some of the Keynesians and the proto MMTers. We're saying that they should do Grexit. And I'm like, well, how are they going to tradition to a productive enough economy to get what they need on an international market now? Now, now, when they were on the drachma, uh, you know, before the EU is a little different, but we've already transitioned to this currency. And if they have to drop off of it and be shut out of the European markets, what do they have to offer? And that's never explained to me. It's just treated as like we're internally cohesive. We can generate production from our own demand. The, I mean, like... And, and the thing is that maybe you can, or maybe you can't. It's a process. You have yeah. to actually develop in that process before you can. So, you know, is the United States government 
a stronger or weaker government than the government of Richard II? I would say it's a stronger government. And the way that you know is that it has more, more, I mean, this one very important metric for how you know is that it has the ability to have a more chartalistic currency than, than Richard II's government did, right? Like it, it doesn't have to deal with like barons within its own territory who are like alternative poles of power to the central government. It doesn't have, it has higher productive capacity, which means that it can be autarkic in things like food or energy. Um, and energy is a really recent one too. We used to not be energy autarkic, and that's part of wh- why the the oil crisis pinched us so much, right? But it's not like because nobody is absolutely sovereign. Absolutely, We're not supply not chain sovereign. autarkic for sure. Nobody is. Nobody <laughs> right. can. No, it's right? just like a fool's errand. <laughs> it costs you a lot to try and pursue this. Right. Right. Although the U.S. is like insulated from its inevitable lack of total control over everything by the fact that it controls the international means of payment, which means that, yeah, it doesn't control everything, but it can pretty easily get anything that it wants. Because yeah, it's like the, part of it, part of why, yeah, um, part of why the U.S. doesn't need to pursue autarky to begin with, and it's very obvious to them that they don't, is because that the money that they can make unlimited of happens to be very close to essentially printing 4X. Yes. Right. It's not entirely, but like, for example, inflation is really bad right now. And then the dollar just got more, it just got stronger because of complicated reasons involving Europe. Um, and with that stronger dollar, guess what? Everybody else's inflation is now even worse because right. now not only do they have to deal with uh, the inherent inflation from the supply chains, but now they have to deal with the current, the asymmetry of value between the dollar and whatever in which they need to purchase things in the international market and everything else. So th- this has always baffled me because MMTers have literally told me to my face that stuff like, well, Venezuela pegging its money to the dollar is a, is a, is an ideological um, decision. Uh, decision. And I laugh at them. I just laugh. I just la- I'm like, because they need dollars for their import, and, and they don't just import. I mean, they don't import capital goods barely. I mean, they're not doing industrialization stupidly. They're 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 food. They're food dependent. They don't grow enough food because it was a cash crop economy for hundreds of years due to the fucking bourgeoisie and um and uh, the the you know like all the everybody working as tenant farmers on haciendas exporting. I don't even remember what Venezuela exported historically, but some probably sugar, or some bullshit like that, and um, and that means that they weren't using the land to, to to grow their own food. So to this day, the entire economy is skewed such that Venezuela doesn't grow enough food for its own people, so it needs to import it. And that's why when the oil price shifted, you know, Chavez went from being uh, Chavismo went from having raised living standards because it redistributed food in such a way that for the first time the average Venezuelan like you know grew in their nutrition to presiding over the worst famine in Venezuelan history basically which is ongoing because yeah. because they could no longer use the oil money to get food in sufficient quantities for everybody which is why they've right. been doing super rationing and, and to imply that they just don't do this for ideological reasons is apply they are so stupid they're willing to risk starvation through inflation just cause like all this off of misunderstanding for other reasons though because they didn't realize the way that they should have like they had a window of opportunity in which to um in which to like reorganize agriculture and develop other industries for export besides oil and they chose not to they chose to well, do yeah. the welfare state stuff first which which, which I, I i pointed out was a problem and we actually this is a similar problem with russia after uh believe it or not, after the Soviet economy, when they didn't listen listen to Khrushchev in the 50s, when he said, we have the nuclear bomb, we don't need to throw a whole lot more money into a whole lot more arms because like, we can nuke the world now. What are you on? And they continued a military buildup policy and not producing consumer domestic goods. During the 92 transition, they also continued that policy because the oligarchs did not transfer that into new kinds of consumer production, but it remained in raw resource extraction and in the pr- production of military goods, even on the oligarchs, because they just, I don't know, I, they were probably not encouraged to do it by the by the Americans who were advising them at the time, because uh, the Americans were evil. Um, um, th- then this continues this problem now. And Forex makes something make sense that MMT doesn't. And I'll explain it to people, because a lot of people were talking about uh, uh, 
Putin's ruble stunt as a way to de-dollar. And I'm like, what are you on? The ruble stunt is a way to get not so much dollars as so much euros, but something that's in a reserve currency to strengthen their own currency so they can buy other things um, mm -hmm. with it. It is not, it is not about uh, making a ruble international trade currency so they can get other reserve currency in their basket and they can backdoor bypass the sanctions by buying stuff with that reserve currency because people have to buy rubles from them. It is, you know, which is a kind of currency sovereignty, but they're not pricing stuff on the open, you know, internally based on the ruble. They're using the ability to gather reserve currencies with it. And it's clear, and that makes sense under Forex. It makes no sense under MMT, if you actually think about what, what MMT claims. Yet a lot of people who promote MMT don't seem to understand what MMT claims, to be honest. I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about the the uh, economists here who do not make this mistake, but many popular promoters, you know, who think they understand MMT because they listened to a podcast once, uh, maybe even mine, um, will say, well, well, it's just de-dollarization. And sometimes even somebody like Michael Hudson will be pushing this stuff in public. And I'm like, you know better. Like, um, and I, this is why this stuff really matters. Because if you don't understand this stuff, you cannot explain what is going on right now other than by saying, it's just ideology. And basically implying that most of the world is dumb. They are not dumb. Like, ugh. Sorry, it's a rant, but it's really made me mad about an implication in MMT that people don't want to admit. Yeah, and that's um, <laughs> hard to agree there. With that, the hand of an there, there can definitely be dumb decisions made within the scope of the development of one country, which have oh, huge. terrible consequences, like for Venezuela. Or, they're or, just or, using... or even ourselves, even like yeah, or, on for sure on, on demand, on demand of manufacturing with no reserves um, is idiotic. I mean, <laughs> our, our, arguably, we're the most egregious example of that in the U.S. Since we have access, like our money, of a high degree because it is the international payment standard, yeah, and we're not using that to do type forms of development which paid huge dividends for us in the past. Uh, we're I mean, not, yeah. I mean, this is this is this is one so of the. I mean, it, 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 yeah. This is one of the interesting things, Steve. I think I think we agree on this that the conditions MMT strive in the United States actually could be used not just to benefit the United States but the world. But the moment it starts benefiting the world, the MMT conditions don't really apply. Like, and that's that's something that I that I push back against because when they try to tell small states. That they can do MNT type policies. Ever since I lived in Egypt, and Egypt flirted its currency under conditions of advice of both China and the IMF, and they they sold it on MMT like reasons. Purchasing power in Egypt went into free fall, and mm -hmm. and this seems to be a like I've had people argue with me about this as I was experiencing it in real time. So what the MMT years often don't know is like, I'm trying to get them to either come up with a theory that explains what happened with their own theory or to admit that they don't have a, a theory that works for small states because Forex basically says, sure, MMT years, you're right. You're right about imperial states with large power, large, both military and productive power. They need both. All right. Um, and in periods where there's no one like this, there's going to be nobody in, in issuing currency like this. And when there is like a power that can command that, or at least tries to, you know, you might see stuff like it, attempts like uh, the Mongolian rulers of China, I forgot the dynasty's name, attempting to impose paper currency, but it didn't work. It didn't take. Like, like they still yeah. ended up using and then, metal. Um, the, the you know, there's other... Rebelled. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm done. There's other historical examples like the the internal market of China was so huge that and it there may or may regions within it that had very little need to develop um, the operational concerns to have a metallic standard and they could get by just fine with chartal means. And it's like why why did that work there? Oh, okay, well they don't have as much need of forex to begin with. And the way you know, true. The, Oops, sorry. Their resource base can be handled more, more, more often in more deep 
hopefully with credit. Okay. So and, and the, go ahead. True, sorry, just, just to add to that. The way you know that's true, you know, a chartalist might reply. Um and Dasan makes noises to this effect, and I've seen it in I can't cite a paper, but I've I think I've seen it in Ray as well. Uh you know you'll sometimes hear a chartalist say, Well, wait a second. No, it's just that like maybe it's that there's a technological impediment, right? Like maybe you can't do a chartal issuance that's just paper money until you develop anti-counterfeiting technology that mm -hmm. lets you do that. And then like once you do that, you don't need metal anymore, but that's what the metal was for. And then, you know, there's a huge problem though, which is what was the first money? A purely chartal accounting system that was just for payments in kind, right? And in fact, for thousands of years, that's all there was like anywhere um, as far as we can tell. Um, because uh, China had a payment in kind system with an accounting system too. So like then you go to metal and then sometimes you'll develop a paper currency. And then China had a paper currency in one dynasty. I think it was the Song Dynasty? I'm going to get that wrong. Sorry, I suck at history. I know the Yuan uh, Dynasty tried to impose a paper currency, uh, but it didn't Comment stick. section, back us up. The, yeah, the, I, I think it was the Song. And thank you, Colin, for that, for, for letting me forget it was the Yuan, which was the Mongol Dynasty that I was thinking of. Thank you, Colin Drum. Um, uh, anyway, they had, they had paper first. Yes. And then they had to transition to a more metal system. When right. the empire broke up, so it tells you everything. So that would be the Han Dynasty into the into the multi, uh, to the Three Kingdoms period. I think. I don't think that they had paper in the Han, though. I think that that was that was a metal coin. I think it was, it was later. It was medieval. There was a medieval Chinese dynasty that had paper uh -huh. money. So it, then, after the Yuan, it collapsed under the Song. I think um, it was the Tang. Yes, it was the Tang. Yes, the, the, the Han uh, Dynasty. Uh, Thank you, Colin. Uh, the, again, and no more of things Chinese currency related. Yeah, the I still have to I still have to actually sit down and like study the sequence in China. I only really know it in the Near East, uh, the and then kind of into like the Mediterranean. But the yeah, like the there was there was a pattern where like they they went from paper to a metal money, and it specifically had to do with decentralization and a smaller currency area. There you go, right? That tells you everything that you need to know. It's and and you you know like so again, it's one of these cases where you have like competing theories looking at the same thing, which one makes predictions that fit the evidence better um, and that like let you make predictions successfully. Um, I think that like, unfortunately, although neotronalism was a huge advance because getting us thinking in, of money in terms of issuances that circulate and receive back is huge. Um, but the problem is that like, once you've done that, that's not enough to explain. I would even go further, Varn. I think it explains a domestic economy, period. Even a small country has MMT superpowers over anything that it itself makes, any goods and services that it right, can right. make. If it can command the service. Zero, if you it can know. command the service. The thing is, though. The problem is, you know, you're, you're constrained by these structural constraints, and there's no getting around it. And it's, and it's not just a matter of making a policy decision to do a peg. That's not the thing that constrains you. The thing that constrains you is, are there things that you can't make yourself? What is the system that everybody else is using to buy stuff? Who controls that system? What rules have they set up? Those are the things that constrain you, not the, you know, just like a, a dumb policy decision that you made to make your money out of gold uh, that, that if only you had known better, you would have known to do paper money. So one thing there, there are, there are deep implications to some of these differences that I want people to point out. If you buy MMT story, all things are explained by ideological and uh, understandings of the central state. If you take Forex's story, some things are explained by the ideological insistence of the central state that has not gone away as a factor. We're not pretending that it doesn't matter, but if you look at why it would break down and why there'd be other forms of money, it actually even fits with some of the observations in debt. Debt makes an observation that credit, credit and, um, and debt relations because of gift economies predate, you know, all other forms of money. And they're basically the first form of once you start keeping tallies of them and move past an honor prestige system and into a tally system for this, 
um, you have something like money uh, in a credit and debt relation. But he mentions that barter is still how you operate between hostile or semi-hostile or unknown groups. Uh, metal, I think. You mean no? I, in an early period, in the early anthropological oh, data, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. really, really early, like pre temples. All right, because temples seem to be crucial to this for some reason. You're dealing the 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 anthropological yeah. consensus. Now we don't actually know this, by the way, because hard evidence for projecting back on societies that are, say, immediate return hunter-gatherers when they run into other societies and they do trade, they do barter. And so most people project that back on the time. Uh, in that book, David Graeber does that. Now, I actually think in, if from his last two books, he wouldn't do that. Uh, that I have my problems with that, and that's a whole other series of podcasts I'm doing. But yeah. um, Unfortunately, I think Dawn of Everything, my personal opinion is increasingly that the later Graeber books hold up way less well than debt. And I, like well, I still I, the book because of the literature that it summarizes, but the 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 dawn of everything, I'm I'm down on it. I'm pretty much anything Graeber writes after Occupy. I don't take that seriously. Um, but Bullshit Jobs has some interesting, and Utopia Rules has some interesting things. But again, it assumes actually kind of like what we're talking about MMT that ideological formations are the primary driver, and I don't believe that. Um. The, the other thing I would say that this explains is it gives you a reason why some of these currency systems can work, but they can't work on their own. And I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of that. If MMT was completely correct and you had a fairly auto, uh, autarkist state like the Soviet Union and it's trying to have some kind of market socialism, which it did at some level, um, it didn't really try to it also have set prices in some places have markets and whatever it, you would think they'd be able to just have one currency, but they don't. They set three different currency exchange rates. One for one that is not market-based for individuals within the Soviet union, a different one for firms with for Well, actually for sectors, because they don't have firms sectors trading with other sectors within the Soviet union. And then a third one for international exchange. All right. And the third one is semi-floated, kind of like China does now. They would not have done that um, if they could have gotten out of it. Because that created structural weaknesses for them, which they realized, which made them dependent on foreign investment. And if you don't believe me, you can even find Stalin talking about it in the 40s. So, right. like, this is something... That you can take an actually existing society within within the recent lifetime, in which we have good documentation, and apply both theories to it. One makes sense; the other the other makes it seem like they had no reason to attempt that. Now, there's their their, their answer to the problem did not work. It led to an incoherent internal economy. But why would they even attempt it in the first place if it was that simple? And I keep on running into this with not even going back into the ancient world. Not even going back to the Rome, which I'm obsessed with, but also into weird economies in the 20th century that can't do what MMT... Like, why does Cuba get into the binds it gets into? It can command good labor and does, right? You want to... You want It can do that. You want to see what it does with the health care system. And people bring that up all the time. MMT is bringing it up all the time, even though Cuba doesn't have currency sovereignty. But that's another thing. Can't really... Doesn't really float as currency. Um, but... It cannot command buying anything from other countries and it doesn't produce all it needs. Right? Yeah. So yeah. again, if MMT worked on this purely autarkic internal system, they would be able to do that. Now, some MMTers are smart, right? And talk about like the limits of internal production and this, that, and the other, but then they'll kind of like shift the room and say, well, you know, they could do it or, or maybe they could have like an African union where, and I'm like, so how but how would you stop that African Union to running into the problems of the European Union? Well, they don't have a 3% rule. But why do they have a 3% rule? Uh, ideology. No, they have a 3% rule because the, the states within the union can't agree on what acceptable um, what acceptable inflation would be, right? And the 3% rule is an attempt to bypass that. So, like, it doesn't... It, it's, well, it's, I, I think it's possible even to do it. I wouldn't go so far as to say that you can have it. But then you have to design it, 
it has to be a conscious political project and the circumstances have to be right that allow it to happen. Right. Like, you know, and you have to, and you have to like actually like figure out like which countries would be a good fit for it because they have similar needs. Right. And needs here as like biophysical needs. Right. And also like diplomatic geopolitical needs. Right. So now you're, now you're in a world where you have all these things floating around that are structural constraints on your behavior and you have to like take them into account in order to make things work. Right. So, so when you look at this, what I always accuse MMTers of is like, okay, you're, you're correct about imperial powers and you're correct about how accounting works, but you're, you're, what you're telling me is that the entire economy is run by the accounting of that economy in chits, not in these other real constraints of which they have, you kind of ignore them. And and they'll say, like, well, but we say that the wealth of a society is its amount of production plus the amount of natural resources that it has. And, and I'm like, yeah, but you don't really go into what that really means. Um, so well, they, they focus on like, the, they do the, it's the physical resources which matter in terms of development and not so much, uh, or not at all, rather. Uh, what you're, if you're in a balance, if you have a balanced budget or not, like you have infinity money, you have finite resources. Okay, fine. You don't have one of you. They're missing. They're missing the biophysical resource of forex since it's something that you don't, you can't make infinity of, and other people, to varying degrees, will accept your money internationally. But it's definitely not a given, and it actually is intertwined with your own development. Whether right. or not they will, like Cuba, right. Cuba. Part of Cuba's development strategy was to pump up its medical medical sector, and that actually that required a fair amount of imports to do. Mm -hmm. And they have and programs it got them for from the didn't. Soviet Union. I mean, like <laughs> that gives so. them a degree of autonomy, and perhaps, uh, well, the word choke point is wrong in the medicals <laughs> to describe a medical program, but it gives them a leg up on other countries, and they. Um, but that, there's a limit like to that. Part of the program is they, they get hypodermic their... needles, like for real. Like they do. Yeah, not like so you have the you have an amazing labor force in terms of like engineering and medic medical talent. Completely uh, brilliant. Um, who, who? What if they don't have what they need? It's like a military. It's like you have the most important sector of a military is the logistics and supply chain sector. Uh, if your tanks have no ammunition, they will do nothing. If your soldiers don't right. have food they, and you know water and, and transportation, they will do nothing. So the same can be said of like doctors. If you who can't get spent your twenty tanks years through training. a mud bath, you do nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the same yeah. can I mean, be said of Cuba's doctors training. and you know. Exactly. Right. And yeah, and they, they and they found ingenious ways around the logistics problems. I actually give them credit for that. But there are real limits, and they occasionally hit them, even in the medical sector. Now, I, I say this because it's it, it is kind of it's both a disproof to like capitalist explicit, like explicitly capitalist explanations of this, where you know the the Cuban medical school sector doesn't make sense. But there's also a thing when people throw the I, I bring that up because it's thrown out sometimes by 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 Marxist MMT hybriders who try to say, well, Cuba has, you know, some autonomy. I'm like, it has autonomy over labor and it has a very, and it's worked around that through high educational needs and initial investment through stuff it got from the Soviet Union. Because again, everybody can't do this. If you don't have that initial Soviet hookup, you probably can't. Um, and so you need hookup from somewhere to get the initial startup. And they, and they, they did all this, but they hit real walls sometimes, like hard ones. And then... Some of the responses to it, as uh, JMC has actually talked about this, can lead to political instability when they have to, like, in their dual currency system. Well, why would that be a problem if MMTers are correct? Right. And, and that was a foolish decision, too, because I think the party thought it had to in order to stimulate tourism or something. But I think that that was a, a gross miscalculation, personally. The The... Because I mean, like you see what it what it wrought was the the the, the giant protests and the continual hyperinflation. Uh, but um, I okay, so we're pretty far field of Dasan 
and I don't think we're going to be able to get to the to the rest of it, or I don't want to get to the rest of it because this conversation is much more interesting. I'll just wrap that with a bow by saying that there's other things that Desan gets wrong that we kind of take this approach of comparing the predictions of the two models. She gets the free minting system wrong, for example, basically arguing like it's under the centralized control of the king and that it acts almost kind of like an endogenous money system like of the modern world, and it doesn't. It's decentralized, but it's not under the control of the king and they're like a franchise of of him or something it's it's a scheme by which the the minter and the king can get a little cut of the metal um of anybody who brings the metal to make coins and it, it, it's it's basically like she describes it incorrectly and then the other thing that she gets wrong is the kind of like dynamics of the um of the transition to paper money um if you want to read about that stuff keep your eye out for the full essay but having said that I want to actually like add on to something that Steve said. Mm-hmm. Because Steve, um, Steve gets to the core of something that is just so exciting to me because I did, the first economics that I learned was development economics. The first economics that I learned was the history of people trying to industrialize. And I learned that through histories that were like case studies, you know, books like Hajun Chang's Kicking the Ladder, um, for example, or Alice Amston's The Rise of the Rest case studies of countries that try to industrialize um, and also like case studies of how the great powers industrialized. How did America become an industrial country? How did the USSR try to industrialize, right? Like these are, um, why, why, why were things so shitty in the USSR even after like 50, 60 years of industrial development, whereas like Japan, like, you know, 10 years after World War II, it's like the most hyper, one of the most hyper advanced technological societies on the planet. How does that happen? What, and it's, it's a very complicated question. This has always been what's haunted me is that reading those historical case studies, money was like a black box to me. I'm speaking from my own personal individual experience. Um, I'm sure Steve had a very different trajectory because he actually is a real economist. I am not, I am a journalist, writer, intellectual dilettante person who learns about things kind of like as I, as I talk to my smart grad student friends and so forth and then get reading lists from them. But, um, I'm a poet obsessed with weird shit. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, ditto. that's a good description of me too. I, I feel like, I, I like weird shit too, by the way. Yeah. I mean, we're all right. I mean, that's strange. Matter, so. But, but what I mean is that like, specifically money was always the scary thing. I would read one of these histories and I would understand everything that happens on the level of like the institutions and the geopolitics and stuff, but then the exchange rate would shift or like the state would not be able to pay its debts or there would be like a, a sudden, um, you know, a sudden depression. And I would be like, okay, but why does that happen? And in the more like political histories, like, they just kind of treat it like the weather, you know? Mm-hmm. The thing that is so liberating and so empowering about the theory of Forex to me is that it takes MMT's understanding of money, but then it combines it with this, like, you know, Perry Merling money view stuff and drums analysis of the coins and modern kind of like geopolitical analysis of the of the international reserve currency system. And it creates this kind of unit unified system for understanding how money intersects with imperialism geopolitics and industrial development and i think that the real prize here is not actually the theory of forex it's what the theory of forex makes possible which is as steve said understanding all of this in a developmental context right right Countries are trying to build up their productive capacities, or as Hajun Chang says, to augment their productive matrix. And in doing so, they have a number of different options. And also countries, what is a country? A country is its state, it's its bourgeoisie, it's its working class, it's its trade unions. There's all these institutions and classes and groups that have their own positionality within these systems and agency. And they're all constraining each other's agency. And they're also constrained by the laws of physics and what is possible in an industrial process or the level of knowledge that exists within a country. There might not be a single quantum physicist in the country, in which case you can't do a nuclear bomb, right? So it's like, you know, the, the, and, and you have to kind of like figure out, I'm in situation A, the country is, let's say a agrarian, every, everyone's growing cash crops and exporting them for the great powers. I want to be in situation B, where a nice industrialized social democracy with healthcare 
right? I'm not even shooting for like real social. Let's just be like a nice little mixed economy with high standards of living. How do you get from A to B? Like, I think that there isn't really a serious, like there, there's no serious guide for rulers, like, you know, or, or for social movements, like, like a Machiavelli or even like a, like a Marx or a Bakunin or a Lenin that really tells you how to do that. That there, there isn't. I think that the germ of what that guide for political practitioners would look like would come from synthesizing the theory of Forex with theories of industrialization and how you actually build up the productive capacity of countries combined with socialist institution design so that that industrialization happens on a radically democratic basis and on a redistributive basis rather than on you know, on both like a dictatorial and hierarchical manner of organizing production and also a, um, a highly extractive and exploitative method of redistributing with surplus. So like that's, if you combine all of those, I think that you've got your game plan for how to do socialism. And we are far, we are a long way from that. I don't want to say that we have that. We don't. The whole purpose of the project is, in fact, to kind of get us inch by inch there. And we know that we, as in me and Steve, are not going to be the ones who crack the code, right? It's like a whole research project that's going to take a lot of different people looking at it from a whole bunch of different angles. But I think – I speak for myself, but I think Steve would also probably agree that, like, this direction is the way to go. Like, we need – what we need is that is that primer for, like, okay, I've got my country in this situation. I want to get into this situation. What do I have to do? Well, I mean, sure. Um, you threw a lot of words out that made me want to reach for my revolver, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a whole nother discussion. But, but, um, you know, what, one thing I will say is if you don't understand, like, each of these theories that we pull from, including MMT, are useful for advancing certain limits and conversations and prior theories. Uh, Marxism's theory of, of class and, and the way class works in the MCM circuit is, is, an, is a step above classical political economy. Now, there are times where I think there's legitimate steps backwards, like the entire period of marginalism. Um, but, but in general... These things are like I do think, for example, MMT's use of anthropology, its understanding of the early, uh, of the early empires' uses of debt, uh, of debt, its understanding, um, m mostly from the from the historical research of Michael Hudson, its understanding of the way uh, there was internal and external, well, internal and external currencies developing. Um, uh, with 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 church things, these are useful, um, and we we have done a lot with them. They've been a step up from just assuming the Adam Smith Barter theory. Just like we've moved far past the uh, Hobbesian understanding of individuals uh, making deals with sovereigns and forming some kind of contract in the primordial history that never fucking happened at all. But but. Even with Hobbes, you actually have an advance, believe it or not, in my mind, from most of what was going on in the West, because it's a secular theory of state that does try to understand why anyone would have agreed to this crap in the first place uh, and just tries to make an argument that they agreed to it, which it didn't. And, and um, you know, th there are other theories. I mean, even come Dune's actually far in advance on Hobbes from the same, from about the same time, just a little earlier. Um, uh, and I bring that up only in so much that if you're trying to form a political program, if you're trying to have a historical materialist theory, and by that I'm not using historical materialists in the limited, you know, uh, Detson sense, you know, from the from the 19th century. I mean, a theory that takes social inputs, material inputs, and doesn't assume um, total structural dependency or make a call on determinacy or indeterminacy for individuals, um, because that's not something something like that can settle even. Um, but builds on that, if you're trying to develop a way to set the conditions to have a to have a better society, of which things like I think uh, relative equal power uh, power access is important. Um, 
democratic inputs, which would be part of that equalization of power access, the abolition of classes, uh, et cetera, this, this has to be understood because you have to set the conditions for which that is maintainable. Otherwise, you're basically verbally masturbating into the void. So, um, and I know people get mad when I say that contingency matters, but only when there's a material condition for which can, like some random contingency can develop because most, like, even today, if you were to ask a thousand people to be honest about their epistemologies, completely honest, I bet you get 900 epistemologies. Like most of them don't end up mattering because most people don't actually do anything with that. It doesn't have most material connections. It's not that it couldn't matter. It might matter if that person's at the right place at the right time with the right set of conditions. And so... So, you know, this is not to say that ideas don't matter. When people hear me say this, they think that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, like, what ideas matter is not determined by the fact you had them. Like, and and we as socialists, if we're going to make that Karl Marxian impetus, impetus to, we know that we make the world, but it's not of our own design, right? I mean, you know, we make the, the, the world is how we design it, but it's not of our own making that thing. Um to to design societies that can resist to do what you want or what I want, we have to understand these things, and we cannot project conditions now back into the past, um, which is, you know, let's be kind to MMT. Most systems have done, and I would even say early Marxism did this. It assumed certain conditions um, uh, would be from its own time period, as insightful as Marx and Engels were, were steady state. All right. And we have seen historically the kinds of mistakes that can lead you to. And if Marxists don't want to deal with that, then they're kind of a bad turning what is a research and political program into a cargo cult. All right. And that's what I don't want us to do. And I think MMT, for all the shit that I've given it tonight, was an important step to getting us out of another kind of cargo cult that we were kind of stuck in. All right. And it did give us some insights, even by accident, you look at NAP, into things, you know, as a thought experiment and, and from historical examples that we couldn't explain under classical theories of political economy or neoclassical theories of political economy or Austrian theories of political economy or, frankly, Marxist theories of political economy. And we were able to move past that. But then there's all this stuff it didn't attempt to explain. And that stuff actually ends up really mattering when you're trying to make policy proposals for states. And the other thing that these people will do is pretend that the description of one society is universal and that that projection is not normative. All right. So they move from a descriptive of one society to assuming that's the universal and then claiming that assumption is not a normative assumption. And that's, and, and you know what, MMT is not the only people do it. Marxists have done it. Neoclassicals have done it. Hell, we might be doing it now. But um, it has been a limit and people get defensive about that. Like, so I'm, I'm going on this rant to say MMT has been important for us getting certain things figured out. But we have to figure out these things that it doesn't explain. If it has no historically predictive capacity in certain areas, it means it's not true in those areas. And if other theories do and can explain the conditions explained by MMT now, um, then you should go with the more robust predictive, historically predictive theory and see if it leads to any predictive capacity for the future. Will it necessarily? Maybe not. We don't know. So, uh, you know, material conditions change really fast. But for example, Forex is related to your guys's supply chain. I'm going to call it the, the great supply chain theory of inflation which ties, you know, gets, you know, kind of ties together uh, cost push and monopsony pricing and this, that, and the other. Um, uh, it, it's related to your history and critique of the limitations of chartalism. It's related to my applications of like deep anthropology and trying to understand which ways we can use them. And I mean, people think, I just think we can take hunter gatherer rules and apply them one-to-one. -one, and I absolutely do not. Um, what we can replicate now under current conditions and what we can't. What we can replicate using technology, information technology, and what we can't. And if we don't understand that, we can't do any of this. So this is why your work is important in rent. <laughs> well said. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I, my my shortened version of what you just explained in great detail is like, okay, um, it was a great discovery, MMT, so let's build on it by taking what works and then trash binning the rest and moving forward, like people who are doing actual science, you know? And, and Steve, I have a question for you because I we haven't actually talked about the long range trajectory stuff uh, in a minute, I think. So I'm actually, I know I'm asking this in a public venue, but <laughs> I am actually curious. So like, that was, that was my kind of a dick move of JMT. All right. <laughs> like, but I, that was just me. I'm wondering like, where do you see the theory going in the future? In much the same direction. I mean, we have, um, I think it's critical to include Forex as one of the biophysical resources, which MMT correctly states is like the real engine of, um, of, of growth for and develop, not growth per se, but development of an economy. And uh, so we're that um, the supply chain theory of inflation and the Forex theory, uh, these are all just kind of first attempts at a least wrong um, understanding of historical outcomes that like you try, you don't just find something that sounds intuitive and then say, look at this, two things happened at the same time, therefore one must be causative. You right. say, what was the actual linkage? What were the motivations of people who developed these rules by which to manage Forex? Or what were the rules by which people choose a, one price for a consumer good or for an asset price for that matter, and then try to sell it at that one instead of another one? And like, what are their motivations? And um, I'm sounds like all three of us are more committed to the view that you should look at what you should go out and observe what people are actually deciding and what their motivations are and take a more historical pro approach to developing your theories than is generally on offer um, in some circles of the, the left. Yeah, I would add to that only what our uh, what our shadow contributor today uh, has added. This is uh, from uh, Colin Drum. One thing we need to do is to tie this into the critique of national income accounting and the way that an economic aggregations hide power relations and create mm -hmm. legitimacy narratives, which I, I totally yeah. agree. Um, yeah, um, that's true. I mean, uh, um, you know, GDP is just a, a monstrosity. <laughs> Right, it, it, it's a monstrosity that explains that's the worst things, example almost. But but it's also a monstrosity. I mean, there's all kinds of like when you when you deal with an aggregate, you have to talk about what the aggregate's actually showing you, and it's usually showing you something, but it might not be showing you what you think it's showing you, or what it's being used to legitimate, right? Because like yeah. GDP is yeah, used yeah, to yeah, legitimate right. horrible um, shit. So that's part finding better KPIs essentially for a socialist mm -hmm. economy is, I think, part and parcel to what like what you you said in your great rant and mm -hmm. like we followed up with it's like uh you okay well, like um we want to go out and observe concrete things and we want to develop a theory but then we also want to apply that theory in concrete ways as well and then uh remap it back upon the theory to see if what we believe is least wrong is still least wrong yeah and i mean like for me this is like really concrete like i don't give a shit about cpi i mean cpi very sloppily tells you something is going on because they picked they picked like the you know like a basket of goods that tend to be important for people and if they're all going up okay that's an issue but although the basket of goods excludes a lot of weird shit let's be honest like, it's super it's really important to people right so it doesn't even tell you everything that's absolutely right i mean like um, like housing and education and medicine right. have never been included yeah. in cpi so like that, when we're talking about eight percent inflation we're not including that anyway so, what is like, <laughs> if not in new york in the last 30 years has become more, sorry sorry what is gentrification if not the idea that everything in new york becomes so much more expensive so that the city is unlivable because the price of everything has gone up because rents have gone up. Isn't but that not in CPI at all? 
<laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And that's like, and it's also like inflation has nothing to do with the money supply, really. Like it, it doesn't have to do with like there was government spending that did it. It was it was the price setting power of the landlords. Like, I mean, among many other factors, I mean, like asset prices do sometimes have to do with like booms and, you know, and, and more activity. So it's not like, but, but like, and for the, the strength most part, of the state and, and its relationship to, to private capacities actually is a limit on rents and IPs, et cetera, and so forth. But I mean, and, and Colin is saying that like there, the, it is kind of reflected in CPI. And I would say, yeah, but in, like he says in weird ways and I say in indirect ways, like, yeah, right, right, like. But it's like, there, but you you would have to comb it through with a fine tooth comb, and then look at. I mean, I do think like part of why that stuff is excluded from CPI makes sense, and in other times I'm like, yeah, but you're really hiding something with it. Another I mean, one, another really, big one. You're hiding whole mechanisms where, like, I mean, farmers farmers love commodity inflation; they love it, right? And like other other groups of capitalists would say the same. And then, and, um, like, the stock market is pro-inflation, inflation of stock prices. Right. And then there are other groups that are obviously, I mean, if you, you want to minimize your costs, okay, you're, so you're pro-deflation. And CPI is, like, hiding all of these decisions that get made um, based upon power imbalances or uh, trust for, like, trust formations of one type or another between businesses along supply chains. Yeah, I had this discussion. That are with, like that get totally hidden. I had this discussion with Sam Kangaroo recently where we were arguing about QE. And I was like, okay, technically QE is a market operator that doesn't directly cause asset inflation. I never include I never include accused it of causing money uh creation, which was I don't know why I was being accused of that, because asset inflation and money creation are not the same thing. Um, but uh, and then he was like, but it's because of investment, you know, hype. It's not because of direct investment. Therefore, it's not the thing. And I'm like, yeah, but it's predictable. And he was like, but that's animal spirits. And I'm like, if I hear that Keynesian thing one more time, I'm going to reach for my revolver. Um, because where, why in one sense, you're right. The aggregate prediction was not just predictable. It was part of why it was originally done. Right. So like, well, and, and but this gets to where, what kind of aggregates we should make. Because this is the point that I wanted to go to. I was just setting up a point. Like, I don't give a shit about CPI, not because CPI doesn't tell us anything. Of course it does. It tells us a bunch of stuff indirectly. But why not just cut the bullshit and actually look for the stuff that we want to look for? So, for example, yeah. what yeah. bullshit there was, was a, a giant index that was highly, like, disaggregated. So it's not actually just, like... Like a, ge a general index, it's more like a like a like a bunch of indexes that you then like have lined up next to each other. And I'm sure there's mathematical ways of making it even more elegant, so that you can look on a highly granular level and in fact zoom in and zoom out in like cities and regions. And it's just a ratio, the ratio of the medium wage to the most important consumption goods right. and their prices. Like that's all it is. It's the ratio of what people are being paid to what they have to buy in order to reproduce themselves, right? Like, why isn't that ratio just like on a highly decentralized level, just collected, all the data is collected everywhere and you can look at it on the national level, on the city level, on the regional level, you can even draw a little circle on a map and then it does the ratio for you automatically based on the data set. Right. Why, well, you why can don't we do this? Why don't we have that, it? I mean, we that, do have that it, wouldn't, not That wouldn't be there. that bad. We have, we have some more granular, like consumer basket of goods like consumer staple type uh like uh what's your rent what's your how much does a vehicle cost to lease it etc cetera, etc cetera. right Things i mean that you, most you people have... care a lot about and you could take that and then you could divide it by the median household income and you just track that that'd be I was, so we we actually do have that uh jmc but it's not tracked directly as you're saying by like the bureau of labor statistics or any of the other federal accounting mechanisms um but you can find PPP per, for those. And I know, I know we're throwing out all these economic acronyms, CPI is consumer price index. Uh, PPP is purchasing power. Uh, parity. parity. Um, yeah. It's and, a tax, right. Yeah. It, well, like for example, one of the, one of the things that like occasionally a smart right wingers would point out about national minimum wage is like the PPP is not remotely the mm -hmm. same from one part of the country to the other. Um, and they're not wrong about that. That's actually a problem with the concept of minimum wage being set as an actual number and not like a percentage compared to something else. Um, uh, and people 
also knew that in the beginning of the 20th century. It wasn't like unknown. Um, uh, so either it was sold to people as if, well, we'll, 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 we'll real adjust it by legislative fiat as things. Yeah, yes. that's worked. Right. Because um, that works really well, as we've discovered in the New York period. Um, so, I mean, and that's, there's other stuff like that, like alternative minimum tax, not that I, you know, totally feel bad for hot, but right now, if things continue the way they're going, you will hit alternative minimum tax and not be high income anymore. Cause it's set at a number. I think they may have fixed it, but they have to fix it. Ironically, they have more incentive to fix that one than they do to fix minimum wage. But even then those are based on national aggregates, whereas purchasing power is not national remotely, as we were talking about with New York and California versus, say, Indiana or yeah. Arkansas. Or I used to say Utah because I came here because the PPP was good, but that ended in during COVID. But like it's been shot dead and like kicked and set on fire and then pissed on and then set on fire yeah. again. Um, but uh, but that's that's where we're at, and. These statistics are available, but they're not easily available. And they're often done, unfortunately, they're often done by private organizations who don't lie, but as Colin was indicating, present them in a way to legitimize or delegitimize a certain narrative because they're they're done by them. I mean, you know, there's well, there, okay, like you know there are some there are some who would push back on the discussion we're having and say like, well, all this misses the point because inflation measures are socially constructed. And, and I'm always just like, next person okay. says socially constructed to me, like, not real. I'm going to shoot. Okay. I mean, yes. Okay. <laughs> what did you, did you have something actually interesting to follow up that with? Yeah. Or, yeah, like, some, you have like, okay, so I let's shoot. socially construct one that makes more sense for us and our friends. Yes. Right. That's because, exactly right. because it's useful. It's a tool that's useful yeah. for you to do planning. Yeah. So, so like the, so just to get back to my, you know, crank proposal for a second, following up directly on what Steve just said. Okay. All the data out there exists, but it's organized in such a fashion as to make it very difficult to very quickly and briskly and effortlessly assess mm -hmm. the ability of people to meet their needs in any given city region or area of the country. Right. Like, because making people able to uh, creating a situation where everybody is able to meet their needs, no matter what they're paid is not a top priority. So therefore we don't have the tools by which to do so. A tool like this ratio would be like the, or not the, but like one of the performance indicators in the same way. It's like, Oh no, GDP fell. This is a bad sign. This shows that like the country is declining. Right? Like, and there would be politics about it. Well, if, there was a region where that ratio dips below or above, depending on how it's organized a certain level. That means that people are no longer able to make ends meet in that area. That is an immediate emergency. That politics will happen. Right. And you can, and, and you can check it if it's like a public data set and people make like little map tools that make it even more transparent with data visualization and all this other stuff. Right. Like we could do it and I, we, we should even go further. I mean, why isn't there a nonprofit organization? This sounds so crazy, right? But what? why isn't there some kind of like, you know, collective group that is not a state, but maybe it receives a bunch of funding from a bunch of different sources, you know, that basically just rates countries by how socialist they are and does just like the really socialist according to a complex set of criteria that tackle the different distinct but interlocking elements of what socialism is, which is of course a thing that's up for debate, which is why, like, so you know, maybe there's no things. The, the, the right, social right. democracy here is beginning to turn my stomach, JMC. But, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is literally what we have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it as a thought experiment to get us thinking. Like, how do capitalists exert their power over a bunch of different countries, right? I mean, they have one of the things is that they have these ratings agencies that literally, mm. like, do like the standard and poor's ratings that when they shift, there's a whole bunch of things that become either more or less viable for the relevant. Right, I mean, like the, the, the literally countries compete on a, on a credit market with their bond rating. Just uh, like in Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the standard and poor's bond uh, country risk methodology go in there sometimes and you'll find it's essentially a rubric for how to do imperialism. Yeah. yeah. These it's the like means of a accounting quantitative system, means of assessing how capitalistic you're being like as an imperial hege hegemon. 
and how little you should trust countries that are trying to do social democracy or something. I right. mean, like a number, a number, not like a feeling. So, you know, like the thing about those numbers is that obviously they would be reflecting value judgments w with, you know, that, that different socialists can disagree about those value judgments. Mm -hmm. But I think that in general, you could, in principle, get a group of different socialists with different concerns, right? Like, so some socialists are going to be about, like, universal free provision of everything otherwise and like some are going to be about abolition of markets some of them are going to be about abolition of wage dependency which is a slightly different thing from right. um from the abolition of markets some of them are going to be about democracy in the workplace or democracy over investment well what if you create a metrics for each of those and then there was like you know a kind of like overall rating that's like an aggregate of them but then there's also like breakdowns on the specific dimensions and then you just create you know, you continually rate and re-rate countries based on that. That's crazy, right? Because, like, who would do that? Well, the answer is somebody who wants to build socialism and who has, like, a, like, complex and multifarious but also sort of, like, you know, like, like aggregated. Uh, it's you know, still methodologically nationalist, JMC. Oh, yes, I know it is. And, I'm, and I know that I've been using a lot of methodological nationalism in this conversation. And it's pissing you off. And I get it. And it's, and it's. But the thing is that this kind of thing, you could use it to rate co-ops or to rate cities or to rate regions or to rate economic organizations. No, 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 no. no. I mean, I like, we've already like, known from <laughs> Allende's Chile and, like, three shitty computers in a country uh, that just had the correct data given to the correct people at the correct time. That oh, you yeah. You do a lot of this. The, and, and the, the – and, and you start doing this like to rate countries, you're developing technologies that could be shifted very easily to non-status means. But you, you have you, my only my concern about design is that has to be built into the design for moment one so that it does not stay that way. Um, there are cul-de-sacs in design because design, unlike say social evolution, has a teleos. Social evolution doesn't have a teleos. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Hegelians. I, I mean, right. I think even this one was nationally um, based, was particularly as a tool to critique countries, though. Right. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which would be like, like, none of you are socialists. This is darn yeah, trading. Yeah. But like, <laughs> none of you are socialists because you have not done this thing or that thing. Or you've yeah, only right, right, right. up to this level. Well, it could be like the e ESG <laughs> investing, but instead it's for so the socialism meter. Yeah, like and that, these are the criteria that we agree that socialists kind of like. You have a five on this one, a like, ten on oh, this you, one. You go, you're running low on the government does more things. Uh, yeah, gauge. So, so we got ding you a bit. <laughs> no, but but here's my thing: is this not empowering to social movements? If especially if the social movements are the ones providing the metrics to a great extent, right? Like, would be right. very empowering. Like I, that. Yeah. That's that's the that's the part of this I like. I'm just. Um, and I think when we talk about like replicating other societies or moving past, if you want to move past markets and money as an information mechanism, because they kind of suck at it in certain situations, a lot of, or maybe most situations, but you don't have anything to replace it other than guessing in central planning, um, uh, the, our, 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 it let's be more liberatory paracon where I have to spend most of my life in meetings for the rest of my fucking life and not right. kill everyone. Right. Um, but uh, because, well, because, because I mean, with all respect to Michael Albert, who I think that some of his stuff about internal co-op firm dynamics is pretty cool. That, that pericon model is like, it's, it, it, it takes the imaginary price mechanism that the neoclassicals think exists and then it replaces it with like a single plan where everybody somehow knows a year out everything. Yeah, that and, and you can't change unless you fail, but then you can't change during the failure because you agree to it a year out. And that, also, how am I going to social plan? Works. You can't, you every, can't do central planning that way. It's yeah, like, it's, no, I talked to some, I've talked to some other people who are Democrat, who are more democratic socialists than even me, um, who, I don't like the word democratic and socialist together. It also makes me ill, but um, uh, not because I'm against democracy people. That's not my, that's not why, um, but uh, it's redundant. <laughs> it, it, yeah, kind of. And it, it's, it, it's redundant. And it also usually means um, most people mean it to be in like Republican democracy representatives, which I think right. have a perverse, uh, a bunch of perverse incentives that creates, yeah. that creates certain class dynamics that I don't want. But um, 
what I'm saying here is like, you can do this. You can outsource a lot of say a thousand meetings a year where we try to plan everything in the fucking world. And then like, we don't somehow erupt into mass violence because, because when I think of Paracon, I'm like, I would have killed someone like, like yeah. just, I would have gone in there and be like, like you're under planning and we're going to starve, die. And then we, you know, that's, that's not good. And that we don't want violence. We want a minimal violence world. So, um, um, uh, you need, you need, you need planners abilities to do that. And, and I also think, I mean, we have to figure out what people actually want because none of these words mean much in and of themselves right now, including like when people say d d democracy in the workplace, I'm like, well, what do you mean? I know right. what you mean by it. Cause we've had six hour conversations about it off air, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know what everybody else means by it. So like. Are when people are like, I want equality. I'm like, well, I believe that inequality, if you define it, or freedom, if you define it, but in abstract, that's a highly abused principle that's dangerous. Like, so if you don't give me a definition, like people get mad at this because I'm like this with justice. I don't think there's a justice to really, like it's rhetorically useful. I wouldn't like ding a socialist for talking about justice. But if you ask me to like use it as a principle for planning, I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, can you give me a definition that I can use it as an operative principle? If you mean fairness, well, what do you mean by that? You know, do we mean, like, is it is it we all have fair outcomes or we all have fair access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are things socialists really have to define, pin down, and make operant principles of. Like, and if you don't do that, then it's just rhetorical tricks and I don't give a shit and, you know, we should probably beat you up. I mean, you guys probably wouldn't beat anyone up. But... I <laughs> but <laughs> but, but um, this is the KPI idea is so powerful, though, right? Because like an institutional analysis that says this or that institution is better for our values or or our society that we want to create than other institutions, then we can actually measure people's progress towards or away from those institutions, mm -hmm. and we can and we can quantify it, and we can make plans around those quantifications. And this is like what smarter. I mean, back when liberals were able to do things, when they were social democratic liberals rather than like neoliberals, like and they knew how to do planning. That's basically what they did. And they invented not just like the world system, but like the quantitative management system for the world system. GDP, Chatham House, the Freedom Index, Gini mm -hmm. coefficients. All these fucking things are administrative tools for accomplishing objectives yeah. that are rooted in institutional analysis, rooted even further in ideals and values and utopian schemes for how the world ought to be arranged. Um, and um, although those utopias have to be constrained by a realistic analysis of material conditions, I, I think didn't constrain in, them though, because well, like they use market equilibrium, which oh well, yes, I know. I mean, stuff I like care. that requires the abolition of fucking time. But yes, um, but I mean, but yeah, you you are right though. In the set, in in a way, these these KPIs are like zombies because I don't even think a lot of the people using them now understand what they were originally used for. That's true um, too. And they become like it's like it's like a, my favorite thing is like we can't build the rockets we built in the '60s because like we used it on out of date technology and like recorded over it and put it on like five inch floppy disks that no one can read anymore. <laughs> and um, and I'm mean, serious about this. And like we're trying to reverse engineer the shit we built and we don't really know how we did it. There's a lot of stuff like that, even in economic data. Like, yeah. So, um. Anyway. We're, we're on a long tangent. Uh, two closing points from uh, from both of you, and then we're going to actually stop, and I promise I'm not going to rant. Go. Uh, James C? Oh, I first... Um, okay, I was thinking of my conclusion. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of mine, too. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to rant while you think? I can do that. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, that would that would be helpful. Just a little... little you, you, you get us started, and then we can uh, go around. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think the forex gives us a way to look at the relative justice. I mean, because one thing that I, I've been thinking a lot about is like a lot of stuff that MMT or suggest as policy recommendations deduced from the descriptive model works in the U.S. or works in the U.K. or works even if the if the EU got rid of its stupid three percent rule would actually probably work. And you could design an EU to do that. It would be more contentious. You'd have to make the European Parliament actually matter. 
Um, and, it, you know, there, there are ways. And I've talked to MMTers and some of them have good ideas about this, actually. But then I kind of think you have to start weighing, though, how this plays out on the international stage and quit pretending like the imperial production is not part of this because because like occasionally i hear people say something smart like okay well we need an african union to be a power balance i'm like yeah but they would have to capture so much foreign currency to be able to command this nuts development or have it given to them at, for cheap for i don't know by china or something and um and do this that and the other otherwise you're you're not really getting them out of the situation we will still steamroll them and while I don't want, you know, I don't want necessarily all the world's population to have all of its wealth. Although a lot of people I do, let's be honest. There are some people who need a lot less stuff. Let's be, let's like, let's be clear about that. Certain groups of people, certain individuals, etc. cetera. But, um, but I would, I would, I don't want, like, I'm not interested in revenge here, but I do think we have to like, be honest that some of these policies without looking at this in a global context would maybe even exacerbate global inequality um, in a way that we, I don't think I'd be comfortable with. Um, you know, that's not my goal. I'm not trying to parasite off the rest of the world. I've lived in it. It's kind of cool. I would like it to survive climate change, which it might, we might, none of us might. Um, and, you know, and stuff like that. And yet there is stuff that I think is super important, like dumping a ton of resources and developing new energy technologies like right now, like right now, yesterday, right now, and figuring out how to make energy grids, water grids and stuff more efficient, uh, produce food in ways that aren't so dependent on natural fertilizer. And these are things that like we can't fuck with. We need it yesterday. Like um, and, and, and some of these policies would be good for that. But without, if we take it all, it's like just uh, the United States can spend whatever it wants because it has sovereign currency. We don't care how it has that sovereign currency. And if you look at certain M certain MMT groups, they don't care because I see who they appeal to. Mm -hmm. Like they will make a make appeals to right wing nationalist groups and 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 and. Now they think they're being cynical. Um, and sometimes I'm like, you are underestimating who you're playing with, and. Uh, they might screw you. Uh, I just want to remind you of what happened to Syriza. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that's my rant. Okay. Does it help? <laughs> yes. I, all right, so my rant is... Um, yes, rant. I want to see Steve rant. I've never heard of him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 what I'm hoping for our Forex theory is that it's something that is testable and that we can update... Uh, as we go, like as like a community project of sorts, and it gets us back to like a the more a, a profoundly socialist tradition of problem solving, like people actually solving practical problems to get people things that they need, and it get and it provides a better rubric to understand, um, like what are all of your resources that you have, what is your goal. What material things need to happen to bring you your goal closer to you on average over time, over a time period that you specify? And it it gets to like it answers the hard quantitative questions, which sometimes I think people would rather shy away from and maybe even retreat into theory a bit when they um, should be seeing what works and observing things and then theorizing based upon that instead. Absolutely. My rant is <sighs> it's a doozy and I want to get carried away with it, but you know, I've been talking in this kind of episode about like what it would be nice like to have a nice little social democratic country with a welfare state and blah blah. Partly because I think that like you know my strategy in programs like this is like you know not to always preach to the converted and to like try to do like a minimum, uh, you know a minimum viable product for people that you know and then kind of work your way up to that. But if we're talking about like what I want, I mean I want the whole Kahuna, you know I I want the abolition of classes and the abolition of the wages system. 
and for people's ability to survive to be completely divorced from their need to work. And when they work, for it not to be in dictatorships under the control of absentee owners and their hired managers, but under some form or other of democratic control of the workers themselves or some group co coalition of workers and consumers or other stakeholders, but at any rate governed as a democracy and to the greatest extent possible as a direct democracy where people are sitting around in a circle talking about things and arriving at compromises and then acting on their collective decision rather than you know appointing some savior figure who goes and makes the decision for them and then usually screws them over because they got bribed by some capitalist. I don't want there to be capitalists. I want to get rid of intergenerational inheritance at the scale that allows people to accumulate this kind of like exorbitant wealth. And I don't want there to be like, you know, the state controlling everything because I don't like the state, at least defined as the military and the intelligence services. I want to get rid of and the cops. I, I want to get rid of those as much as possible. Um and replace their useful functions with, you know, a, a system that is less and less recognizable as a top-down hierarchical state system. And I want open borders, whether that means like open borders for all, or whether that means continental federations that, you know, have open borders within them and then maybe deals with each other and eventually become some kind of world federation. I don't think that's crazy. I think that that's something that we can work towards. I think that we can have a global minimum wage, not just a fixed minimum wage, but one that like Varn was saying, is like a percentage of living costs everywhere. I think that we can have, uh, you know, an end to sweatshops. I think that we can have the development of the of the of the of the poor countries, but we can only have it if we end imperialism. And I want to end the fucking empire and close the fucking military bases and end dollar hegemony and have some kind of decent international system wherein everybody is able to like, you know, participate in the decisions that have to do with international trade on a relatively, you know, not just egalitarian, but developmentalist basis, but also one that does the green transition, right? Because it's the other thing that we have to fucking do is change the entire economy and not just this like, you know, net zero, um, and that zero by 2040 bullshit target that both the neoliberals in the West and the Chinese Communist Party have agreed to, which is a bullshit target because it's 10 years too late and the target is fake because net zero means carbon offsets and carbon offsets don't exist. I want zero is zero and I want it in 10 years, not in 20, because we're already going to probably be dealing with like irreversible calamitous and possibly genocidal consequences, even if we do that, and any longer that we wait is out of control. And we can do it. There has been industrial development on that scale in the past, but it would require, well, first of all, someone to get the ball rolling and then international uh, collaboration. I want all these things. And I and they are very radical because they would mean the the end of basically uh, you know private ownership over the means of production by a, a class of rentiers, and it would mean the end of the imperial system and the creation of something like a world federation. But if we're going to do that, and of course, like the socialization of the means of production as well. But if we're going to do that, we have to actually know how we would do it. It's like I just sat here and threw out a bunch of fucking crazy schemes, some of which are probably gobbledygook. But some of them are probably closer to being realistic than they would have been even like out of my mouth like five, ten years ago because they're rooted in particular analysis of particular institutions under particular systems, whether it's the capital system or the imperialist system or the state system or whatever, and then trying to figure out institutions with, you know um, – with predecessors in the past, whether it's the welfare state or whether it's workers' cooperatives or whether it's whatever, that, that can replace them or their useful functions, right? That's, that's the key thing. And, and you're going to need not just like that historical institutional analysis, but then you're going to need metrics for success. How close or how far are we to the system or family of systems that we would prefer to have as opposed to the ones that we have now? And I think that the left has completely abdicated the responsibility of developing those practical plans and those and those concrete institutional analyses and those metrics for success um that um that that uh you know that that would allow us to actually get from a to b um and to do so in like a truly um you know anti-authoritarian internationalist manner um and i think that that you know, like I wish that a lot of I, I wish that a lot fewer people were reading about like value form theory and that a lot more of them were reading about like, you know, input output planning or fucking SNOP processes in multinational corporations. Because if they were doing the latter, then they would be doing what Marx was doing in the British Library, right? But instead they're kind of turning Marx into like a mummy 
like 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 the Lenin mausoleum, um, you know, and then just kind of like you know worshiping at the altar of his of his you know dead formaldehyde stuffed body. Um, so I think that that's kind of that that's my rant basically is that I, I'm not saying that I have succeeded or that Steve has succeeded in doing this, but it's it's our aspiration to kind of push things in that direction as opposed to into the direction that would have us be reading like endless philosophical theoretical um, you know kind of kind of texts um, you know so so that's kind of um, that's. I mean, I guess, I guess I should pitch strange matters. I don't know <laughs> if, if you, if you, if you like that kind of perspective, uh, we've got this magazine, strange matters. You can find it at strange matters.coop and Stevie sounded like you were going to see some. Yeah. Our website is strange matters.coop C-O-O-P. And our fundraiser, uh, our official fundraiser has ended um, where we were accepted into this period on Indiegogo called in demand, where if you want to buy a perk, you can still do that. Um, so definitely go to tinyurl.com slash strange matters if, if you want to buy some merch or get a subscription. The subscriptions are discounted through Indiegogo. So definitely take advantage of that um, before uh, the in-demand period ends. And um, yeah, uh, the website is coming along. We'll have a shop up eventually. We'll have sub subscriptions up there also eventually. And History of Turtleism Part 2, like we said, is out right now. Um, yeah, things are coming along. Thanks to, thanks to a really amazing degree of support, we have the money and resources we need. We have the Forex we need in order yeah. to, to develop ourselves for at least one year. And um, hopefully things will go well and we'll get a lot more cool articles, including the Forex article, out to you very soon. Yes. And um, articles by people who are not me and Steve as well uh, come, have, have been coming out and will continue to come out as we start our online only stuff. Uh, but we also have more extracts of the book coming out after Forex, uh, further critiques of MMT and aspects like exchange rates and this question of development and biophysical stuff. Uh, and then also like, you know, eventually maybe an article about this like socials KPI stuff. And we've got a whole bunch of ideas floating around. All right. Uh, I think there's a lot to discuss. Uh, you guys will be on in the future. There will be a special episode where JMC and I talk about nothing related to strange matters, but actually poetry in light of my second collection coming out from Mysterio Press, um, uh, etc. You got to ask about when the subscription page is coming. Um, uh, so when is that coming? Oh, well, you can get a subscription right now on our Indiegogo page. So go and to the Indiegogo. That, yeah, once that's done, we'll put up the, the the subscription page for our website after after that's done, basically. Right. Yes. So you can still get not only a subscription, but swag at tinyurl.com slash strange matters. Uh, and... Uh, the uh, they let us extend it because we met our target. So if you want that mug, which everybody seems to be obsessed with, or one of those T-shirts, uh, you just have to donate at the at the uh, required level. And if not, you know, thirty dollars gets you a subscription. It's going to go up to thirty nine ninety nine um, for a yearly print subscription in the uh, once once the paywall comes up in the next month or so. So get it while it's cheap. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, all the money from the fundraisers going to our writers as soon as um, Indiegogo disperses it to us. So we are, well, not all the money, but like all the money that's left over after overhead. Um, and above, at an above market rate, as you yeah. might have seen us say sometimes on social media. <laughs> Ad nauseum. But it's true. And we're, and we're very proud of that, that we're going to pay writers more than they would get at comparable magazines. So, Which is usually nothing. Right, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, I mean, like, easy to beat the market rate, but yeah. we're going well beyond just merely. Yeah, you're going it. about the the fair market rate, not the not the market rate when calculated for how many left wing magazines subsist off of volunteer labor. Right, um, <laughs> yep. uh, it's not exploitative at all. It's not that left wing magazines are more exploitative than even general magazines in that right. But um, anyway, so yeah, I I say people support strange matters. You. 
Um, they're doing interesting stuff. Uh, I've had them on a lot. They're going to be on a lot in the future, including other people who work with them. It's not just these two guys who I'm, you know, uh, beating up. So if you're going to sub to something, sub to them. And they don't have the Hamilton of Haiti as their, uh, as their mascot. So, you know, um, uh, and, uh, that's, that's a deep cut. Um, hey, I have no idea what that means, and I'm pretty online. <laughs> uh, no, you're not online. Was, what you need to know is the debates about uh, uh, Troussant Loventure versus uh, Dessaline to understand why I'm talking shit. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> okay. oh man, okay, well, there you go. So, I, I'm and I, I'm not gonna say which magazine I uh, and maybe targeting here, but maybe I sometimes call it. <laughs> oh. Maybe no. I sometimes call it Orleanist, and sometimes I might even call it when I'm feeling charitable. I might call it Gerontian. Um Now, now. It- um. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I have a, 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 a obscure sense of humor and a very, a very. Uh, I'm throwing some shade, um, but I like you guys, and I, uh, you guys should sub. Totally think it's worth it. Uh, get get uh, if you want swag, get the mug. I have swag, so many things, but I might get some myself. Um, in fact, some of your Patreon dollars are probably gonna go to that. Thank you for supporting me. And, and speaking of that, thank you guys. Uh, I'm gonna have to let you go because I gotta do Patreon business. Uh, so um, I gotta talk to all the all the Khan Il Kahanans because there's a lot of you and a lot of people upgraded their subscription. And if you upgraded your subscription, you actually don't show up on my list of people to talk to. So I'm going to have to read everybody. All right. So I would like to thank all my top supporters. Andy, Agribness, Andrew B, Andrew SR, Engel, Brian S, Buddy R, Carl S, Choice Fantastic, Cole C, Habib R, Harrison A, Ivan I, Jeremy S, Jesse K, uh, Yakin C, Justin H, Kilgore K, The Knight of the Sorrowful Face, Kyle R, LEF D, Marcus G, Marxism Dadism, Minch G, Nathan G, Nueva, Patrick Reed R, Rock for Light, Ryan F, Skippy S, Soup, Stephen A S, Taylor A. The GFC draws repartee Wes. Thank you for being supporters. I really appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'm going to leave you with um, the clothes, the chill clothes, the clothes that we all relax to and have a great day. I hope you learned stuff. I hope uh, these guys inspired you. Please subscribe to their magazine. I really think this project is worth supporting. I wouldn't have had them on three times and at least probably a lot more times um, and more people. Uh, you know, James and I go way back and I'm glad to get to know Steve, but they got a lot of people over there and I'm going to collect them. Yes. Yes, I'm going to collect them. All right. And with that, good night. <laughs>